Good morning and welcome to City Hall. We'll get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Rod Newman is the pastor at Oklahoma City University. He'll lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilwoman Sawyer if she'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But everyone, please stand. Shall we pray? Oh God, we pause this morning to say thank you. Thank you for the rich tapestry that is Oklahoma City community. Thank you for the rain that moistens the earth and thank you for life itself. We appreciate this new day because we know that it is not just any other day. It is a day where there will be births and deaths. Anniversaries will be celebrated on this date because of what happens today. Marriages, and new jobs, and people getting driver's license. Make us good stewards of this day, alert to opportunities to care for each other, guide us to make good decisions for the benefit of all. We pray that you would bless those who work in offices and on the streets, those who are sick and those who care for them, our schools and travelers. Bless this council in their work. May we all give our best as we celebrate our life together. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mayor Rod Newman has taught my Sunday school class from time to time, and he is just a great teacher. We have a number of family-owned businesses in Oklahoma City, but very few of them are celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. I'm going to ask Larry and Andy Schwab if they'll come forward. We have a proclamation uh, for Schwab Meats as they start their second century of business in downtown Oklahoma City. Congratulations. We have a proclamation. I'll ask the clerk to read it as we get settled. For as George Peter Schwab immigrated to the United States from Germany and began his meat company in Oklahoma City in 1912, and his curing and preservation of meats and slow hickory smoking process continues to this day. <clears throat> Whereas Swab Meat Company organized pork processors and set standards for food safety that continue to this day. The company moved to its current location in 1920 and has grown nationally and expanded many times. Whereas George's grandsons, Larry and Scott Swab, now run the family business. Whereas, Swab Meat Company is well known for its community and charitable involvement, sending beef rations to troops overseas and providing assistance to local charities. Whereas, Larry Swab, president of Swab Meat Company, spearheaded a before and after school program to encourage walking and exercise that resulted in more than 4,000 Putnam City School District students participating in the 100-mile program. Whereas Swab Meat Company has survived the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, and two world wars, and emerged each time a stronger company with a greater commitment to Oklahoma. Whereas Swab Meat Company now celebrates 100 years of business in Oklahoma City. Now, therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim January 29, 2013, as Swab Meat Company Day in Oklahoma City. Let's show our appreciation and acknowledgement of this wonderful day. Congratulations. That is great. You bet. Thank you all very much. You bet. And uh, we'll see you again in 100 years. All right? Okay. That, that, that bicentennial will be here before you know it. agenda. We're on item three. It's the office of mayor and we're going to begin with a presentation from the Commissioner of Health and the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the state of Oklahoma, Dr. Terry Klein. Dr. Klein has been asked by the council and I to come in and give us an update on several health issues that affect people that live in Oklahoma City. Good morning. Great. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. 
uh, city council members, other officials. It's my first time before the city council, so I very much uh, appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today. What I'd like to do is to provide you with some background information and talk about a couple of uh, very key issues uh, that are challenges for us as, as a state. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank you for your great work and leadership uh, in, in terms of transforming uh, Oklahoma and, in particular, Oklahoma City. I think those are benefits that we will see in short order uh, that will benefit not just the residents here but the entire state. So I have some uh, background information for you. And I'm just going to key this up and see if it goes. may need to enlist some help. This is not a very informative slide. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, so does this work, actually work though? Going backwards. I don't think it is. Maybe it's not turned on. So what we have in front of us are, uh, we talk about health a lot. We talk about the health of our residents. We talk about our own health, health of our families and communities. But many times we're confusing health with health care. Uh, and we are often confusing all of those things that actually determine our health. We talk about going and having our doctor's visits. We talk about some things that we might do. What this uh, slide actually shows you are those primary determinants of health. These are the things that actually influence our health. And if you look at that, you can see the role of the city and the role of the city council uh, represented in many different places there. I did a presentation. Just last week, uh, the city manager was there, and he heard me say in front of a different audience how important uh, water and sanitation is. Something that we take for granted, most of us, every single day, is something that has a huge benefit uh, on our overall health. If you've ever been without that, uh, you recognize uh, immediately how important that is. And if you look at unemployment, health care services, housing, work environment, all of these things influence our overall health. The next slide actually uh, makes the point of, of, of telling us what proportion of these different types of activities have the greatest influence in terms of impacting our health. So we talked about all those determinants. And now if you look at, well, how much of that is uh, attributable to which factors? This is a study that was done by the New England Journal of Medicine. And, and it's a good news, bad news presentation. Uh, the good news is that the majority of our health is actually impacted by what we do. It's what we do every single day. Uh, it makes sense when you think about that. What I do immediately when I get up in the morning, uh, you know, am I heading to the cigarette pack first thing uh, as soon as I can crawl out of bed, sometimes not even crawling out of bed? Uh, what am I putting in my body in terms of nutrition? How physically active am I throughout the course of the day? Those are the things that have a huge impact. And you see 40% of our health is actually impacted by what we do. That's kind of the good news part of the presentation. You don't have to wait for national health care reform. You don't have to wait for the state legislature or, for that matter, for the city council. All of us have a responsibility in doing that, and we can impact that. And where that gets more complicated is that sometimes the healthy choice is not the easy choice to make. And this is where I would like to uh, take a, a moment to congratulate uh, the city council. Uh, one of the things that you're doing is that you're making healthy choice the easy choice in, in many situations. When I'm talking with people about becoming more physically active, and I'll actually have a little bit of information on obesity, sometimes that's easier said than done. If I uh, say this to a family, and I want you to be more active with your kids and go out for a walk, and you don't have sidewalks in your community, you are literally putting your family at risk when you go for a walk with your family. That's not the kind of choices that we want to provide. So the healthy choice there is not the easy choice, because people are basically trapped in their homes. If they don't have a healthy option, they can't go out and take advantage of now the hundreds of miles of sidewalks that are being built by the city. This is a great improvement. So it's actually making the healthy choice the easy choice for people. When you are putting in uh, bike trails for individuals, to be able to hop on a bike and actually go and travel uh, hundreds of miles, instead of the, the people I know who are cyclists, who in the past would be out on a country road uh, hoping that some you know, farm equipment wouldn't be coming down the road or someone who's not prepared for them and there's no shoulder to ride on and bad roads, uh, they're literally putting their lives at risk to cycle, uh, which again, we want to be able to promote that or just provide that safe environment for people to be healthy. The city is doing an incredible job uh, through maps, 
uh, repeatedly putting those dollars to good use for the benefit of all citizens. And literally, you're protecting the health of the individuals who live uh, within this jurisdiction by providing those opportunities. Uh, some of those challenges, uh, if we just go to the, the next slide, uh, you can see that we have had a continual period of challenge in our state. This is a national ranking from the United Health Foundation, uh, America's Health Rankings, and it is a relative ranking. So even if the state of Oklahoma uh, was seeing improvement each and every year, but we were being outpaced by other states that were more aggressively improving the health of their residents, then our relative ranking would go down. It's relative to other states. So even if we were making progress, if everyone else is moving more aggressively, more quickly than we are, then our relative ranking would go down. Uh, so part of this, I want to be clear, we've seen consistent improvements in our health in many areas, but we're not seeing improvements at the same rate as many other states that have been much, much more aggressive, that are moving much more quickly. And I'll provide you with uh, a couple of examples of that. Uh, we are seeing an uptick over the last four years. Uh, part of this, whether you're ready to accept the credit for this or not, uh, I'm crediting some of the changes that we're seeing in Oklahoma City as part of that, and I think we'll see some of the trends change. And because of the huge population represented by Oklahoma City, changes here again, I believe, will have a significant impact on overall state ranking. These are, uh, this United Health Foundation ranking is actually made up of <coughs> dozens and dozens of different factors. You have a one-page handout that was provided to you, which actually summarizes some of these factors. So it has a bar graph there. It has a couple of different graphs, uh, and we're going to talk about those with a little bit more detail. But it basically is broken down into, so it's not part of your multi-packet. It's a separate standalone page um, that has a lot of numbers on it. And it's broken down into different sections. And, and one of those sections uh, is titled determinants. So in public health, we're always trying to get ahead of the curve. We're trying to produce a healthier population. We're trying to uh, really live that mantra, which is prevention is better than cure. So if we can prevent an illness, if we can produce a well population, that's actually better than cure, because cure only goes into effect after someone has experienced an illness, then they're cured from that illness. If we could avoid that entire illness trajectory for an individual and for a family, that's much better. So we're very interested in those things that influence our overall health, those things that determine our health, the United Health Foundation has broken those down into these different categories, which you'll see on that standalone page of behavior, community environment, policy, and clinical care. And you can see how we rank. Uh, and you look at that, you can see there are several areas where we're in the 40s. Our overall health uh, ranking is 43rd this year. Uh, and the ranking that just came out uh, just a couple of years ago, we were ranked at 49th in terms of overall health. But the way we get there is that we have all of these individual determinants that actually drive those changes. Uh, the determinants then influence those actual outcomes, uh, which we have coming up here. Uh, again, dozens and dozens of measures. Um, so it, we will look at a, a couple. One will be uh, uh, diabetes and uh, obesity, and the other will be cardiovascular disease and tobacco use. Uh, I would be here much longer than you would want me to be here. Uh, if we spent more time going over all of these. But I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have if I don't talk uh, specifically to the point that you're interested in during my presentation. Um, so we'll just go to the next one. The first one we'll start with is obesity. This is really, I think, a, a fascinating slide because it shows the challenge that we're facing as a nation uh, for obesity rates. If you look at 1990, the legend is at the bottom. You can see a map of the United States we really only needed two points or three points on the legend that went up to 14% of the state's population being obese. And that's actually measured as body mass index greater than 30, uh, which is the technical definition for obesity. So in 1990, you only needed those three points on the legend, uh, up to 14%. You go 10 years later uh, to the year 2000, you'll see that we've actually, as a country, needed to add two more points in that legend because the country has become so much more obese. And now we're up to uh, a category that includes 20 to 24% of your population being obese. Didn't even need those categories in 1990. 
And then you go another 10 years uh, to 2010, which is the last year I have this national data, and you see that we've had to add another category, over 30% of the state's population being obese. You start to see some interesting patterns emerge with this too. So again, it's in public health, we like to think about how these pieces of the puzzle fit together, how we might get ahead of that curve. If we see a trend that we're concerned about, how can we actually change that trend line? So the uh, actual outcome that we're looking at for this particular slide, uh, which can be a driver for other outcomes, is obesity. If you look at that pattern, there might be some things that come to mind. You just look at the country and that bright red area, uh, you might uh, begin to wonder well, what pattern makes that, it's been consistent over these uh, decades. Uh, why is that more of a challenge for this part of the country? And there's some interesting things that come to mind. I'll put out just a couple of those that might be question marks for you. I'm not saying that it's conclusive. I'm just saying those things that might stimulate some thinking. One could be a hot climate, right? It's, you're talking about a hot part of the country right there. Now you think, well, why would that be a factor? Well, if it's hot and it's inhospitable to outside activities, people might be more inclined to stay inside where it's air conditioned and cool. I don't know, maybe, that could be. Uh, in this part of the country, we also have uh, populations that are uh, centers uh, that are not as dense. Uh, I remember attending a, a presentation from Dr. Shadid on urban sprawl and kind of seeing that spread uh, that makes us certainly more automobile dependent. That means that we're less likely to be uh, walking to work, walking to public transportation. Uh, we might actually you know, rely more on our cars in other parts of the country, uh, in particular uh, areas like the Northeast. That's going to have an impact uh, on our level of activity, which would therefore have a level of impact on uh, obesity rates. Uh, you will also note, if you are looking at socioeconomic status for the entire country, this tends to be a uh, more poverty-stricken uh, area of the country as a general rule. Uh, and we know that there's a very strong correlation between poverty and health outcomes. So if you're looking at improving health in particular communities, job creation is actually a very important part of that. It has nothing to do with my responsibilities as Commissioner of Health, uh, but I'm here to tell you that job creation is important. If people have good paying jobs, they'll have better housing, They'll have better education for their family members. They'll have access, better access to health care, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see how these things really fit together in an interesting way. If we go to the next slide, you'll see the pattern for the entire country. And again, this is just a, a different representation of obesity rates uh, in, our, in our state and in our country. Uh, the <clears throat> bottom line, which is hard to tell the color from this, uh, is actually the obesity rate for the country, and the top line uh, in those later years uh, is actually the obesity rate for the state of Oklahoma. You can see that we have paralleled the country and that increase for a good piece of time, but then uh, in uh, just a little over 2000, you can see a real divergence uh, there where Oklahoma's obesity rate has climbed at a steeper rate than the rest of the country. And you'll see that the, for the country, it's starting to level off a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> and there may be some hope about that changing trend line uh, in Oklahoma as well. Uh, Oklahoma has had the single largest increase in obesity rates of any state in the last uh, 10 years at about an 18% increase. Uh, that's not a trend line that I want to see as a commissioner. It's certainly not a trend line that you would want to see uh, as city councilors. If we go to the next slide, you'll see one of the reasons we're concerned about obesity uh, is that obesity is a primary driver for diabetes rates. And where you see high rates of obesity, you will see high rates of diabetes. So that's of, of grave concern. Uh, if you're looking at the workforce for the population within your particular communities or in the state, uh, if you're looking at health care cost in your communities, uh, or the burden on employers in your communities, uh, you should be concerned about this slide. I heard a, uh, actually it was in a conversation with a school nurse who was telling me, and I used to be very cautious about naming the communities and now I'm much less cautious. I just put it out there because it really applies to the whole state. This is a school nurse from Norman who uh, we were just chatting about some of these things as we do in public health. 
she said, you know, actually we have over 40 kids in our public schools, another issue of concern for you, junior high and high school, who require management of their diabetes during the school day. So they need to have school nurse on board, on staff, to be able to help manage uh, the diabetes for these kids in junior high and high school. And it is driven by obesity, which has become an epidemic. Five years ago, she didn't see that. Maybe five kids, or maybe a little bit more than that, but certainly not over 40. Uh, <clears throat> and that was new data for me. It was very alarming uh, because I didn't see that. I don't have that trend data. I didn't see that anywhere. I know this trend data, but I wasn't seeing it at this rate for kids. So I began to ask about that. When I traveled to Lawton, I asked the school nurse there, what do you know? So she made a phone call. They had over 40 kids in the Lawton public schools. I was doing a, a presentation to Leadership Oklahoma. Somebody was texting during my presentation, which I'm glad to see you all don't text during presentations. Uh, and I thought, she's not paying attention to my presentation. It turns out uh, she's on the school board for Enid. So she was texting to get the answer to that question after my presentation. She said they have over 20 kids in the Enid public schools who require insulin diabetes management during the school day. So now resources that were being used for education <clears throat> are now being used for school nurses because you need to be able to manage that uh, during the school day. So it does have an impact, and it will have an impact on your budget too. And I don't know that trend line for you. You might want to ask that. Uh, but I'm guessing it's the same as I've asked that question across the state. Very, very similar answer. So when we look at our current health care system, which is burdened, underfunded, overburdened, and has too much demand right now, how is our health care system going to deal with this generation uh, that did not have the same demands as this generation does in terms of, of health care? These kids will be managing a chronic disease for 30 or 40 years. And many of these kids are, are, are struggling to manage their weight, uh, and they may well have difficulty manage that, managing that moving forward, which is part of the, the appropriate management for diabetes. And if it's not appropriately managed, these kids may suffer blindness, may suffer amputation of limbs, uh, and potentially, uh, ultimately, death. Uh, if they manage it well, they can be fully functioning, uh, productive members of society. Uh, but I'm predicting that for many of these individuals, it's going to be a challenge. If we go to the next slide, you can see it's important actually to drill down into the data a bit here. Um, we see differences uh, with different racial ethnic groups uh, within our state and within communities. So as you see, even some leveling of obesity rates uh, for many ethnic minority groups, uh, one group where we see a significant increase is in the black African American population. So between, uh, especially between that 2007 and that 2010, we're seeing a very significant increase in the African American population in terms of those obesity rates. So again, when you're looking at interventions, uh, and for you, it might be sidewalks, it might be green space, it might be parks, it might be all of those things. One of the challenges I would put out for you is are we actually strategically placing that infrastructure in that built environment? Are we making improvements in areas that will impact these groups that may be disproportionately impacted in terms of health outcomes? Um, so that's, again, part of your strategic planning process. Certainly, the types of things that I think about as we have uh, targeted African-American uh, churches, we actually contract with a number of African-American churches uh, because we believe that that's a great opportunity to reach a large number of people within the African-American uh, population about education, food, options. Uh, if you're uh, on a limited budget, uh, how can you actually shop uh, and find foods that are healthy? It's not easy. If you think about a conversation with the mayor this morning, the high number of fast food restaurants that we have in our community, uh, and you think about a limited budget, uh, even if you're committed to buying fresh fruits and vegetables and you walk into a grocery store, and I have a family of four to feed, and I have a limited budget, and I have a box of macaroni and cheese for a dollar and a quarter versus one banana that's 75 cents, I can tell you I'm going for the macaroni and cheese. So the easy choice is not uh, always the one that's the healthy choice, and certainly the names imply that. Convenience stores, fast food, I mean, they are marketing uh, specifically around that. So we have a lot of challenges. 
Again, I think the things that the city council has done in terms of the built environment will have a huge impact on our health. And uh, I don't have the slide for this, but you can see it in that single page handout, a new ranking that we're looking at is sedentary lifestyle. And you'll see that Oklahoma ranks 45th in terms of sedentary lifestyle. So we need to do things to get people moving. I actually don't buy the whole warm climate uh, hypothesis. There are a lot of climates that are uh, warmer uh, that don't have the same challenges. You look at New Mexico, there are a lot of places that have inhospitable temperatures in terms of being much colder than Oklahoma, like Minnesota and Utah, uh, that have much better health outcomes. So that doesn't explain it alone. If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll look at uh, the, the last uh, big indicator that I have, and then I have some supporting data. Uh, it's really around tobacco use and smoking. In the state of Oklahoma, right now, we are ranked 47th in the country in terms of our tobacco prevalence rate. 20. So we, if you look at the, the actual percentage there uh, and the latest data, it's about 26%. So you'll see an increase. This is a good opportunity to tell you there's been a change in the methodology. So all of these indicators most likely are going to see a jump. It's more accurate information. It doesn't mean that our trend changed. You see those two points at the end of this. What it means is that the methodology changed, so they're including more cell phone users. Uh, we know that there are a large number of households that are actually cell phone only, and those typically uh, are homes with lower socioeconomic uh, income, um, and uh, many other homes have landlines for secure, excuse me, for security systems and other things like that. So including this actually provides us with more accurate data. But if you look at our smoking rates, uh, right now in the state of Oklahoma, that 26 plus percent, that's more than one out of every four people in the state of Oklahoma is engaged in the number one preventable cause of death. So I'm getting my sympathetic smoking cough for you here, uh, making it clear that I do not smoke. Uh, <clears throat> but even conversation about it brings it on for me. Uh, we have, if you, if you think about uh, one out of every four people in our state engaged in the number one driver of cardiovascular disease. So we have actually more people who are dying from tobacco-related cardiovascular disease than we do from all forms of lung cancer, other forms of cancer combined that are tobacco-related. A lot of people don't realize that tobacco is killing a lot of people through heart disease, but it's not talked about as much. There's been great uh, publicity and, and uh, increased awareness around lung cancer. And we're killing a lot of people through heart disease, a lot. And you'll see, again, kind of an interesting pattern where Oklahoma was uh, trailing, the rates were higher, but we were trailing right along with the rest of the country. And if you kind of smooth out these lines a little bit, you'll see that uh, Oklahoma really just kind of plateaued. It just leveled out. Uh, whereas the rest of the country saw a significant decrease in those tobacco rates. So that's what's really interesting. So we see a decline for the whole country. We want to see those rates go down. Again, it's the number one killer, the number one uh, preventable cause of death in our communities. We want to do everything we can to bring those rates down. And many other states, obviously this is, again, you're looking at those relative rankings. The other states have been much, much more aggressive in attacking this killer and protecting their residents uh, and protecting the health of their residents from this killer. Uh, and the result is those rates have gone down for the rest of the country. And in Oklahoma, they have not. If we go to the next slide, uh, you'll actually see that there is a decrease. If you look at this, it's a little bit closer, kind of microcosm of that data. Uh, and if you were to smooth that line out, you'd see that we have seen a statistically significant decrease over the last 10 years. Uh, for tobacco. It's not, when you compare it to that earlier slide, it's not nearly as steep of a decline as we see in other states. And you'll see the rate of former smokers. So not only do we have fewer people who are starting, but we have more former smokers, people who actually quit. And for the first time in 2010, we saw these two lines cross. So that's really good news. So now we have more former smokers in the state of Oklahoma than we have current smokers. That's good news. I'm not all doom and gloom here uh, so bright and early in the morning. Uh, there's actually good news in this. 
And that's actually, it's a huge issue because what it tells us is that we can drive these rates down. But it takes, remember all of those determinants, it takes behavioral change, it takes policy change, and it takes community change to really drive those down as aggressively as we would like to see. If we go to the next slide, uh, we're, we're obviously very concerned about the rate for kids because that's a predictor for the next generation. And again, we're seeing these rates come down. Can you imagine in 1999, one out of every three kids was smoking in high school? Unbelievable today. So the good news is we can impact that. We're bringing those rates down. Uh, but that makes for a very unhealthy population, a very unhealthy workforce, and a very unhealthy state when one out of three people is engaged in that. <clears throat> now again, some of those structural changes uh, that we've seen. One was, if you go to the next one, uh, you'll see that the overall number of sales for tobacco have gone down in our state. Uh, we had uh, a significant increase in the tobacco tax uh, in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, that we know is a, a primary driver in bringing down rates because people who have less discretionary income uh, will not be spending that income on a product that's more expensive. Uh, and it does drive down those rates. Uh, and you saw that one of the arguments against the increase in the tobacco tax was you will simply drive everyone to the smoke shops uh, from the tribes and you won't see an overall improvement in the state. This makes it very clear this is tribal and non-tribal so we're selling many fewer uh, cigarettes today than we were 10 years ago. Um, so that kind of counters that argument. Go to the next slide um, you'll see some of the impact on this and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do policy wise around tobacco this is the last kind of, of real data slide. This is looking at life expectancy. Again, my conversation with the mayor uh, before this meeting, a lot of times people don't know what they don't know. This is the way it is in Oklahoma. It's hard to know if you, unless you travel a lot, you don't really know, are we healthy or are we unhealthy? I mean, this is what I've grown up with. This is the environment that I'm surrounded by. Well, actually, if you look at that data and you do some comparisons with the rest of the country, uh, one of those gold standard pieces of, of datum that we look at is life expectancy. And you can see most of us know from our own personal experience that women typically live longer than men. That's a national trend, the Oklahoma trend. So if you look at the US data, you go across, you'll see females. Typically, a life expectancy is about 81 years of age. And for men, it's about 76. You may know this experience from your, your parents or grandparents or other people. Women typically live longer than men. But what you may not know is that then if you look at Oklahoma's life expectancy and compare that to the United States life expectancy, it is significantly less. So if you're born and raised in the state of Oklahoma, you can expect that your life expectancy will be about three years shorter than it would be if you were born and raised in almost any other state in the country on average. And you'll see that for men, so the pattern holds true, women live longer than men, you're just scaling it down. So while the rest of the country uh, is at about 78 years of life and we're at 75 and 80 for women, it's 78 for women in Oklahoma. And while it's 76 for men across the country, it's 73 in the, in the state of Oklahoma. So it's a shorter life expectancy. Now, as I said, in public health, we're very interested in trends. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? All of those things. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we're looking at uh, really two decades worth of data and life expectancy. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? So at the beginning of the 1900s, by the way, the life expectancy in the United States, at the beginning of the 1900s, was 47 years of age. And I'm just kind of looking. I'm going to make no assumptions, but do some guesswork, and I'll just speak for myself. Uh, that would have knocked several of us, or at least a few of us, out of the picture uh, with a life expectancy of 47 years of age. So that's an amazing change, right, that we're all benefiting from today. The fact that we're here, if we were to do the average age in this room, uh, it's higher than the life expectancy would have been expected for uh, at the beginning of the 1900s. So great improvements in public health. So then the question is, are we continuing to see those gains across the country those benefits of public health, are we continuing to protect our citizens so that they can garner the benefits of a longer life, or are we not? So in the United States, across the last two decades, uh, you'll see the life, and we look at these big blocks of data, 
Because if you have an epidemic, if you have a war, you have something that causes a change in that life expectancy, that can influence your data. So we like to look at big blocks when we look at these changes in time. That's why we're looking at two decades worth of data. So the life expectancy in the United States has actually increased by about uh, a little over three years uh, over that two decade period. That's fantastic. That is great. That is true success. And the biggest beneficiary had been males with an increase of four years and to a, a smaller extent females at two years. So this is the national data. So remember, women are living longer than men already, right? But now men are starting to catch up. So what we're seeing is kind of a closing of that gender gap in terms of life expectancy. Women have lived longer. They're still seeing some gains, but it's not as steep as the gains that we're seeing from men across the country in terms of life. So we're closing that gap, uh, the gender gap, in terms of life expectancy. That's great for the country. So now let's take a look at Oklahoma. And you've seen the data. So while the rest of the country was seeing a life expectancy increase of over three years in Oklahoma, the life expectancy increase is 0.4 years. So what we know from that earlier slide is we're already behind, right? By three years overall, we're already behind the rest of the country. And as the country is seeing these gains, is Oklahoma keeping pace with the rest of the country? This slide would tell me no, or that we're not seeing the benefits of what we're doing today yet, but what we've done in the past has not produced those results. We have not protected our citizens in the way that many other communities have done. Uh, so three years for the country, 0.4 years for Oklahoma. We look at men, again, the pattern holds true. Four years for the country, 1.2 years, a quarter of the same benefit almost that the rest of the country is, is seeing in terms of that uh, lengthening of life expectancy. And then the shocker, the real shocker is that next piece of data. When you look at the improvement for women at 2.1 years and for women in Oklahoma, a decrease in their life expectancy. So this information has been trended out for decades. And we have, as you heard at the beginning of the 1900s, we've seen improvement since that time. And again, a lot of it goes back to water and sanitation in the 18, late 1800s, all of those things benefiting our population. Uh, we're beneficiaries of all of those decisions. We've seen that trend increase. For the first time in history, first time in history, we're seeing a decline in life expectancy for one of these groups, and it's women in the state of Oklahoma. That is a wake-up call, because we've seen a significant trend line that not, it has not only plateaued, it's not just become stagnant, but it's actually declining. Will it continue to decline? I don't know. We'll have to stay tuned. 2009 is the last year that we have national data. This takes a long time from death certificates and other reports coming in to get that. Uh, so this is, in terms of national data, kind of hot off the press. Uh, but that's a very, very concerning trend line because it does not bode well for the future. So some of the benefits that we've seen in terms of that decline for tobacco use, even though it's gradual, uh, those benefits, I'll just tell you, have not been uh, equally represented between males and females. Uh, women are not quitting at the same rate as men, and we're not seeing the same declines uh, for women that we're seeing for men. And there's been very specific targeting on the part of the tobacco industry uh, toward women. You think about products like Virginia Slims, I mean, who are we targeting with that? Uh, you look at the advertising uh, and many of uh, the magazines that would carry that uh, in the past, uh, definitely targeting uh, females. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is the very last data. It's one that is, is this has so much information included in that. It's the mortality rate for the entire country and for Oklahoma. So this is the rate of death for 100,000 people in your population. So the bottom block is the mortality rate for uh, the country, and the top line is Oklahoma. The thing that's significant about this, I have to clarify, uh, mortality rate, unless you're a, a public health person, uh, may take some explanation, because everybody says, well, as far as I know, the mortality rate's 100%, right? I mean, every single one of us is going to go out. Uh, so that's true. But the mortality rate as we uh, define that are the number of deaths per 100,000 people. So if you were to look at this group as the population of Oklahoma, and I told you that two people every year from this population will die 
then that would be the mortality rate. And then if you were to compare that to if I told you that 15 people out of this room are going to die every year, yikes, that's a much larger percentage of this population. So that would have more significance, the higher mortality rate. Uh, and that's exactly what we're looking at here, except the population is the entire state of Oklahoma, the number of people who die each year out of that kind of fixed population. So you want to see that rate go down, obviously. People living longer, uh, and that's reflected, and the whole country's seen it. So again, the United States and Oklahoma, we were neck and neck right up until the early 90s. And then the rest of the country continued to see great progress and advancement in Oklahoma. It didn't, you know, all of a sudden see a spike. It's not that we had a volcano that erupted and, you know, you know we had toxic environment and there was some huge change. There's nothing like that. What happened is we just didn't get better. We didn't push the envelope. We were not making the decisions as a society and as a community that would reflect those same kind of improvements that the rest of the country was making. And the majority of those types of decisions were policy decisions. You start to think about, well, would it really, would people in Oklahoma just all of a sudden decide, well, I'm not going to do this or I'm going to continue to do that? And the rest of the country, just on their own people individually, were making different decisions? No, this is really about how policy drives the environment and how the environment helps individuals make healthier choices. Is the healthy choice the easy choice? You know, if I was, and I bet there was a day uh, when smoking was allowed in this chamber, is that true? Right? Does anybody here remember that? Okay. So some individuals who remember, can you imagine today, uh, today, I mean, it's just unthinkable that those people who choose not to smoke would be surrounded uh, in a smoke-filled environment. It's just so hard for us to even imagine today that we're changing the norms and we're changing the expectations. And I guarantee if someone came, walk, first of all, they wouldn't get by the guard uh, walking in here with a lit cigarette. It just wouldn't happen today. The norm has been changed. We have successfully changed that norm. The same way that you wouldn't expect to see someone light up a cigarette in, uh, in an airplane uh, or in my barber shop. I remember my barber with a cigarette dangling out of his mouth as he's cutting my hair. I mean, you just can't even imagine that today. We have changed, successfully changed the norm. But it's only a gradual change, and it's only a gradual change in that expectation. Many other communities were much, much more aggressive, and many other states were aggressive in making and limiting that access to that number one killer, tobacco, that number one preventable cause of death. We know it's bad for you. We're beyond that debate. No amount of this product is good for you. If you go to the next slide, uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about preemption. Uh, you actually, and you may not know this, but I think you do because you're a well-educated uh, city council. Most people in Oklahoma don't know that their communities are prohibited, forbidden by law, from enacting laws that would allow them or ordinances that would allow their communities to be tougher on tobacco use uh, than the state law. You're prohibited. The city council right now cannot decide that you are going to get tougher on tobacco than what is allowed by state law. Now, if you want to talk about protecting the people of this community by having more police officers, you have that power. You want to drive the crime rate down, you have that power. You want to make sure that this community is protected in terms of fire protection, and you decide you do or do not want to hire uh, more firefighters, you have that within your power to do that. You have the ability to influence speed limits. You have the ability to influence how strong uh, buildings, building codes, other things. You can get tougher than the state law in all of these areas. The one area you cannot, so usually state law uh, provides a floor. It's a baseline. You have to be at least this strong. You have to at least have these protections for the citizens. But if Oklahoma decided, Oklahoma City decided it wanted to be the healthiest community, then you could do all these other actions. But the one area you're prohibited by law is in tobacco. How bizarre is that? Well, it's not accidental. There actually were state laws that were passed in the late 80s and early 90s that took away the right of communities to do that. You used to have the right, you used to have the power, you used to have the authority to protect the citizens as it relates to tobacco use. But you're prohibited by doing that today 
because of laws that were successfully introduced by the tobacco lobby in the late 80s and early 90s, successfully introduced and passed. So that right, that authority was taken away uh, and has not been returned to this date. So if you go to the next slide, say just a little bit about why it's important. Uh, no amount of, of smoke exposure is good for you, no amount. You can have debates about alcohol, you can have debates about other uh, uh, things that you may put into your body, but the data is very, very clear. No amount of tobacco exposure is good for you. Uh, you can see all the chemicals, toxins, uh, 70 of those uh, chemicals that actually cause cancer. So you, I mean, again, this is kind of connecting the dots. Is it any wonder it's the number one preventable cause of death that's killing so many people? And by the way, you remember our tobacco rate's 47th, our cardiovascular disease rate is 48th in the country. 48th, only two other states have higher rates of cardiovascular disease death. Uh, and it's because our tobacco rates are so high. And you'll see the increased risk for heart disease and cancer. Go to the next slide. Uh, you'll see that it is, it's, it's taking a huge toll on our state. 6,000 lives every single year lost to a preventable cause of death in the state of Oklahoma. 6,000 lives. So I'm guessing if you had an automobile accident on an intersection a few blocks from here that resulted in a death, and two weeks later you had another fatality at that intersection, you're going to start to get calls to the city council. And I guarantee if you have three or four or five deaths in subsequent weeks, your community is going to be outraged. The city council needs to do something about that intersection. You either put in a stoplight, you lower the speed limit, you put in speed bump, you do something to make that intersection safe. And I have confidence that the city council would do it if you had that kind of compelling data where lives were being lost. And people would be outraged. And yet you have 6,000 lives every single year, and you may not be getting those phone calls because people are not connecting the dots uh, with this number one driver, which is tobacco use. And you've done what you can do from the tool chest of available tools that you have available to you, but the biggest tool that's available to you is the ability to make communities indoor air public places smoke free. And you can't do it. So the number one, the biggest tool that you have available to save lives for your community to protect your citizens, you're deprived of that authority and that right, and that power is held at the state capitol. And it's held there for a reason, because the lobbyist, there were 12 paid lobbyists last year, tobacco lobbyists alone, want that power there. They have much more ability to influence the decisions that are made in one building than they would be to influence the decisions that are made in hundreds of communities across the state. So if communities have that right, they have that power, they're going to have a hard time fighting it. And I can tell you right now, there are a lot of communities that are lining up that want their communities to be tobacco free. If you go to the next slide, uh, you can see that we're surrounded by states that have those protections in place. So when I talk, so I'm from Ardmore, uh, and when I talk with Wes Stuckey, who's our big economic guru guy down there, and he tells me that he's competing for business from San Antonio and from Texas, he told me they lost business uh, because there was one particular company, this is just recently, uh, but they're concerned about the health of the workforce in Oklahoma. I mean, my gosh, look at the stats here. These are the people who are going to be driving your economic engine, your workforce, for your businesses. And you better be producing a healthier population if you're really banking on economic development. And if you look at our surrounding communities, they either have a state law that bans tobacco use uh, in indoor public places, or they allow communities to decide that for themselves. That's why you'll see differences in those numbers. Uh, you may have one state law, so you don't need dozens of smaller uh, community uh, ordinances to do that because the state law covers that. I can tell you right now and the tobacco industry knows it very, very well, the possibility of getting a statewide ban in Oklahoma is incredibly low. I wouldn't bank on it. And the tobacco industry knows that. But the tobacco industry also knows if that communities are 
allowed to have that authority that many communities will pass those because you're closer to the issues. You know the impact on business. You know the impact on economic development. You know the impact on schools and resources because you see it all. You live those tough decisions, just like uh, in education where someone has to decide we need more nurses instead of more educators. That's coming out of your budget. So the tobacco industry fears that, and they've been fighting a passage of a law that would return that right. But we're surrounded. So you're looking at economic development, and you're trying to recruit businesses in, and you're ranked 47th in the country, and you were ranked, or 43rd now, actually, and you were ranked 49th uh, in terms of overall health of your population. It's a hard sell. If you go to the next slide, uh, you can see there was a recent study that came out, looked at the 50 most populated cities in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> 44 of those large cities actually have those protections for their citizens. Uh, you look at Texas just as an example. Uh, Texas does allow for that individual right and that individual authority. So San Antonio, just within the last two years, went tobacco free. Dallas, Austin, Houston, all of those communities, they have those protections. As a matter of fact, you can see 44 of the, six, of the 50 largest cities have that protection. Only six don't, and two of those are in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City and Tulsa. So if you go to the next slide, just kind of a visual map of that, you are surrounded by communities that have uh, smoke-free ordinances firmly rooted in place. And I would say to you, <clears throat> when you're looking at economic development, this is your competition. Um, the city manager in uh, Seminole, uh, was telling me they started doing exit interviews for those businesses that they weren't capturing. You know, they're trying to recruit businesses in. So he started asking the questions of those businesses that they're losing, not just why did you come here, uh, but why did you choose not to come here? And health was the number two issue. Education was first. So education and health. So when a business knows that they're, so let's go to the next one. Uh, all the evidence tells us that this is going to be bad for you, Pueblo, Colorado actually passed a tobacco-free ordinance, they drove down the heart attack rate between 30 and 40 percent. Get this, between 30 and 40 percent uh, because they passed a tobacco-free law. Surrounding communities controlling for all these variables did not reap the same benefit. I mean, it is pretty striking. So if you have within your power the ability to decrease the heart attack rate, the demands on the emergency rooms for all of your uh, local hospitals by 40 percent, wouldn't you want to have the power and the ability to protect your citizens and to drive down those rates? Right now, you don't have that ability. Go to the next slide. Um, you can see that the voters from the statewide polls that we've done, they actually understand this. And the majority of people <clears throat> are in support. This is what the tobacco industry knows, too. They don't want this going out. They don't want communities deciding this. Let's keep it in the hands of a few people that we can influence. Because you start to drive this down to the community level, and communities are going to make these decisions to go to tobacco free. I mean, it's just so compelling. Go to the next slide. Uh, you actually have the ability to, to help with this. You have been a great influence. The city council, just as a reminder, actually passed a resolution in support of that change in the law. I would encourage you to do that again. You actually were the very first city council to pass a resolution like that. And since then, we have seen several other communities across the state that have followed suit of Oklahoma City, have followed your leadership in doing that. Uh, so we have a number of other cities that have done that. I can tell you, I have heard conversation from some communities that said, you know what? We have too many people whose lives we're losing. We're going to do it. Take me to court. I'm not suggesting that you do that, uh, because the state health commissioner would never encourage you to break the law. Uh, but I have heard from communities who have said, we're going to step, we're, we're stepping out there. The stakes are too high. And let's see who sues us for doing that. And I bet if you funny, follow the money trail on that, it'll be an, an interesting uh, trail to follow. City manager shaking his head, no, I don't think so. We're not going to go down that path. Um, but it really does beg the question, uh, if you had the power, which you do not have to this day, to save all of those lives uh, within your community, large hundreds of those individuals are coming, are within your realm of responsibility. Uh, are you doing everything within your power to save those lives? 
I would say Oklahoma City has been very courageous, has provided great leadership uh, in pushing the envelope to this limit. So I would encourage you to be very active legislatively. The Oklahoma Municipal League has this as a top priority uh, because they really believe that communities should have the right to decide. These city governments should have the right to decide this for themselves uh, and then let communities decide it. Some communities may decide to do that and some may decide not to. But have faith in the power of decision making at the local level. So we frequently hear rhetoric at the state capitol, I don't want the federal government telling us what to do. We think those decisions should be made closer to home. So feds stay out of our business. How often have you heard that? But then when you apply that same principle on this issue from the state to the local level, somehow that principle, that die hard principle kind of goes by the wayside. So I would encourage you to be very, very active uh, with your uh, legislative body, uh, not just for your community, but if you have any of those opportunities for discussion with other leaders in other communities, the stakes are incredibly high to this. And until we have the ability for communities, I have faith in communities to make the decision that's right to protect those uh, residents within your jurisdiction. And until you have that authority, we'll see that mortality rate that is kind of flatlined at state level right there. We will be refused those benefits for our residents. So if we go to the next slide, and we're actually done, there are some resources, and then uh, time for questions is the very last slide. Um, the State Department of Health, and you also have the Oklahoma City County Health Department, uh, which is an autonomous body from the State Health Department. We are resources for you. If we can be helpful to you in any way, please let us know. You're being held up right now as uh, the example, not just within the state, but nationally, in terms of that built environment. Uh, the one area that holds us back um, is, is tobacco and tobacco use. Uh, actually, the, the Daily Beast, which is a kind of uh, super uh, uh, blog site that's uh, managed by the owner of Newsweek, uh, year before last, uh, put out a huge blog about Tulsa, said Tulsa is the smokiest city in the United States. Uh, when we do everything that we can to improve the image of our state and our communities, as I believe Oklahoma City has been very successful in doing that, we're still combating this image around tobacco use in our state, uh, which is holding us back from really reaching our, our true potential. So with that, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, I will include my comments. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Dr. Clyde, you know, there were efforts made a year ago to try and get municipalities to have uh, opportunities to, to limit uh, smoking. It failed. Yes. W what has changed in the last year? Should we be more po more optimistic or more pessimistic? What What do you think? So the, if, so again, public health, very interesting in trends. So we'll trend out our progress on this particular bill. Uh, two years ago, uh, this bill was, three years ago, was introduced couldn't even get a hearing. So that means no debate. That means that the leadership would not allow this bill to even be debated. So they know the same data, you know, killing 6,000 people, 4,000 youth addicted every year, and you won't even allow it to be debated. So last year, for the first time, uh, we actually got it out of the House committee and out of the House, off the House floor. First time, that really was a huge move. Made it over to the Senate, made it to the Health and Human Services Committee in the Senate, uh, where the chairman would not allow it to be heard. So it wasn't debated on the Senate. Um, so it died uh, a death there. Um, we're hoping that it will be assigned to a different committee this year, uh, one where I mean, you would hope that Health and Human Services would be a good place for that, uh, but it wasn't. I mean, the chairman actually is from Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa has been vocal about some of their opposition to uh, clean indoor air uh, ordinances and laws uh, in part. So again, I just say things I shouldn't say, uh, but I'm going to say them. In the past, there had been a very large uh, corporation that um, owned convenience store chain uh, that was located, headquartered in Tulsa. It has over 500 stores. And uh, that group had actively fought this bill every single year. Tobacco sales represent a very large proportion of profits for convenience stores. So again, you do the math. Uh, and you're really putting raging wages against uh, the health of your citizenry. Uh, 
this last year, the owner of that convenience store said, I'm going to be neutral on the bill this year. I'm not going to fight it. I'm not going to support it, but I won't fight it. And they actually have their own paid lobbyist uh, and said, we won't fight it. So I'm hopeful that they'll take that same stance this year with that large uh, business and not be fighting this. It's held us back. Uh, they've been incredibly successful at um, killing that bill in the past. Uh, and I think part of the reason we saw some movement is that company said we'll, we'll be neutral. So I'm hopeful they'll be neutral this year. I'm hopeful it'll be assigned to a different committee. Uh, and that because many communities are speaking out very, very loudly, uh, that it'll be difficult for your state legislators uh, not to strongly advocate for that change. So when a city council comes out, that carries a lot of weight. And that says the will of this community is that we want to have that decision made here. Um, and that carries weight. So I would encourage you uh, to take that path again, to join with the Municipal League and others uh, in carrying that voice out. So I am hopeful because it's made it an additional step for the year. We will actually begin that campaign uh, in the Senate. And part of the challenge, because this issue has never been debated and there's never been a vote, never been a vote held on this, uh, you have legislators who like, you know, they can claim they've never had an opportunity to weigh in, so they've never been on record for being for or against this bill. If I was a legislator, I would not want to be uh, on record uh, for being against a bill that allowed local communities to make decisions for themselves about something as important as this. And I don't think that communities, uh, that those individual legislators would want to be on record against that. And so far, they've dodged that bullet because it hasn't been heard. So that's the change that we're looking at. Terry, can I ask another question that's somewhat off that subject matter, but the indicator that we are worst in in this ranking number is the number of primary care physicians. Yes, and we 49th. rank 49th currently. Our value is 80, and the best state is 194. Right. What are we doing? So this is, uh, and this is, you know, a little bit outside my sole responsibility. So we rank 49th in terms of the number of primary care physicians per 100,000 people in the population. We have consistently ranked 49th for several years. Uh, there was actually uh, appropriations granted last year, $3 million uh, from the legislature that will go primarily to rural hospitals. So you look at the number of primary care physicians, say, well, we're 49th in the country. The thing that makes that even worse is that the uh, there's a huge uh, concentration of those primary care physicians in our large urban areas. That means that, so you're bad for the whole state, then you concentrate people primarily in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Those rural areas have very few primary care physicians. So the strategy was to fund some residency programs, additional residency programs in rural areas. What the data tell us is that if you do your residency there in those rural areas, you're most likely to stay uh, close to your residence. Uh, within a few miles. So that's part of the strategy uh, to get us there. Uh, yes, Skip, Dr. Klein, uh, first of all, thank you for such a very uh, in-depth uh, presentation of information. Last uh, Thursday, we were together, and um, this issue was part of the, the discussion with the, the guest speaker at the Presbyterian Health Foundation uh, board meeting. One of the, the the interesting comments that was made when the question was asked as relates to this gap in reference to health care, and it was uh, that much of the legislation is driven by the rural legislators. Uh, when you look at the, the issue of smoking, when you look at the issue of deaths and, and major health issues, uh, is that ever really emphasized from the population, per capita population of the rural part of Oklahoma City, uh, compare, I would say the rural part of Oklahoma compared to your most uh, urbanized uh, cities such as Oklahoma City and Tulsa? It would just seem that if there was more information about the fact that people in the rural America and in rural Oklahoma are dying at a more uh, devastating rate than those in the urban areas, there would be some, some legislation that would, would 
would bring about some change. I think for, for tobacco, you might be surprised at some of those communities that have been very aggressive. So you have, uh, just as one example, uh, Tahlequah, which did pass an ordinance uh, which makes all parks uh, tobacco free. I know there's been some debate about authority to do that in Oklahoma City. Um, and there are several other small communities that are being there. So again, they're bumping right up uh, against that line. And they have passed ordinances. These uh, green spaces where families congregate will be tobacco free. And a lot of those rural areas have, have been those groups that have followed Oklahoma City's lead and have passed those resolutions. So I think, you know, part of, again, the, when you look at, so you, you really have two different factors at play here. When you look at population health for the entire state, obviously your population densities in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. So you have huge ability. The decisions that you make will have huge ability to influence the health of the entire state. When you look at representation at the state capitol, uh, then you're kind of at a disproportionate disadvantage in terms of the number of population that you really have and all of those other legislators who may have different demographics that may unite them on some other issues. It just so happens that tobacco is not one of those where we're seeing a difference in the urban area and the rural area. Again, a reason I think the tobacco lobbyists are fearful. They know that you're going to get those decisions made at that local level. And the strategy as you know, kind of going back to the mayor's comment about what's different, uh, we actually did the roll count as you typically do before a bill. Uh, and we knew that we had the votes on the House uh, to get that off the House floor. We believe that we actually had the votes uh, for the Senate floor, uh, but what we couldn't control. Uh, so if it actually went to a vote of the entire Senate, I believe the Senate would have passed that bill. Uh, but again, as you know, a great lobbyist strategy, and I'm not saying it's exactly what they've done in this situation, but it only takes one person in a key legislative position to kill a bill and not allow it to be heard, and that's exactly what happened in this. One person made the decision, it's not going to be heard, and uh, it died. I believe it would have passed in the Senate this year, this last year. My second question. Uh, you made a statement when you were talking about the, uh, the issue of diabetes and obesity and, and young people. Uh, and, and in the African American community, unfortunately, it has a very high percentage as it relates to these issues. Uh, I represent an area that is truly, you know, unfortunate to have the numbers that it has as it relates to stroke, diabetes, and high blood pressure. And you talked about how the educational process has been to have relationships and connections with the faith-based community in, the, in, the, uh, in those areas. What has been the relationship with the school systems? Because I think that a lot of these children, you know, some of their first uh, meals sometimes, decent meals, are with the school system. And has there been any uh, acceptance or working relationships with the county to try to change the, the physical fitness programs, the food intake, and the overall educational process of, uh, of health uh, with the school system mm -hmm. at, all over the state? It, it's a great question. You know, one of the challenges that we have with our state is we are, as you know, um, and there are times it's an advantage and times it's a disadvantage. Um, we have a very decentralized uh, system and where we have local superintendents and we have local districts, sometimes that makes it a challenge in terms of having a statewide type of initiative uh, or law passed, you know, taking the vending machines out, physical activity. We have uh, run a bill uh, for several years that would increase the level of physical activity requirements in schools. It has not been successful. And so again, at the state level, that can be more of a challenge. And I think there's a 90-minute requirement physical activity per week uh, for kids currently. That's not much uh, physical activity. What you do have locally, to speak to the specific question uh, locally, there's a program called Schools for Healthy Lifestyles, uh, which is in many communities, uh, primarily in the Oklahoma City area. Uh, there are about 60 different schools where individual choice of the, on the part of the school 
to participate in this program, and uh, it really is the adoption of a health culture within the school. So it's privately funded, um, and um, is a, and they actually raise money privately to be able to work with the schools and offer some resources. Uh, those, uh, the evaluation for that program is remarkable. Uh, so you're right on the money. That's a great place to intervene. And uh, not only are they seeing improvements in health outcomes in terms of lower body mass index, the, you know, the kind of surrogate measure for obesity, uh, and tobacco rates, and you know, increased muscle tone, they're also seeing an increase in uh, academic scores. Um, so the argument from many schools in the past is, you know, you're talking to us about physical education, you're talking about you know, all these things that take time, and we are focused on our scores. Uh, we have to produce these scores because there are consequences if we don't. And they've always talked about that in a way it was a kind of an either or, like they're mutually exclusive. Uh, so what this data makes very, very clear is that these don't need to be mutually exclusive. You can actually focus on health and integrate it into your curriculum. So it'd be things like math. So instead of just doing old standard math, you might actually be counting calories. Um, you know, this food has this many calories and this food has that many. You add them together, how many calories do you have? How many calories do you need in the course of a day? Uh, you know, to actually be physically fit to maintain your body weight. Well, it's like 2,200. Well, how many of these can you eat and have that body weight? So you're actually educating people about health and you're doing math. You can do the same thing with science. You can do the same thing with geography. I mean, there are creative ways to integrate that so you're not having a separate health class that's taken away from any other curriculum. And schools for Healthy Lifestyles have done a great job with that. There are now, uh, there's a program we have certified healthy Oklahoma program that has certified healthy businesses and communities and schools. And uh, we have over uh, 153 schools that are certified healthy schools. So we actually provide technical assistance to the schools. We actually you know, provide some criteria that you can follow uh, that are those easier to do things. Uh, once you have become a certified healthy school, then you're eligible to apply for a grant from the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust if you receive one of those grants, then that money has to go back into a health-related activity. So you might become a certified healthy school, uh, and then you apply for a grant. Let's say you get $15,000. Uh, then you can put that $15,000 toward, you know, we're going to put in a new track at the school. We're going to take the deep fryers out of the kitchen. Uh, we know it's the right thing to do, but we haven't had the money to kind of reconfigure uh, our kitchen, uh, those types of things. For communities, uh, you can apply to become a certified healthy community. We have 43 communities in the state that have become certified healthy communities. Uh, you have to do certain things to meet those criteria. If you become a certified healthy community, then you can also imply, apply for a certified, uh, an incentive grant through TSET. Uh, that ranges different levels uh, and accumulative over three years. Uh, the smallest amount, uh, a couple thousand dollars based on population. The largest amount is up to $250,000. Uh, and that's the level that Oklahoma City would be eligible for in terms of being a certified healthy community. So right now we have uh, well over 1,000 businesses in the state that are certified, health, completely voluntary program. Over 1,000 businesses. Uh, we just introduced the school category and the community category this last year. So we have those over 150 schools. We have an event coming up, I think it may be in April, for this last round. Um, so we had uh, over 900 applications in these different categories uh, for certification, and over 755 that will uh, be certified. So there are those opportunities as well for schools. Schools are, are, are great uh, places to do that. And many of the schools are certified healthy or schools right here in Oklahoma City. Any other comments or questions for Dr. Klein? <laughs> Pete? Uh, Dr. Klein, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and how much I appreciate you taking the time to come down and talk about this. Um, you probably know that one of the one of the top legislative priorities at the state level for us is this this legislation that we're talking about. Um, I was interested to know to note that your you uh, your concern is that where where the, what committee assignment this gets, and uh, I was. Uh, I, I had a call yesterday about that, about how the city might impact that. And I, it's my understanding that a whole group of cities are trying, working on just that one topic, just try to get the right committee assignment in the Senate. So 
Uh, I plan on talking about that later about how we do it, but uh, I appreciate so much your comments. They're kind of, and all the nice things you said about Oklahoma City too. We, Oklahoma City's kind of elected to take the bully pulpit view of it as opposed to passing a law that our, that our attorneys are telling us we probably would be over the line on. Uh, we've done something with parks where we talked about we, these parks are smoke free, but we didn't say you're going to jail if you don't if you smoke here. We just put up the sign. And I think our experience has been, I've talked to the parks director about it, and if you just look at the number of cigarette butts they're having to pick up today compared to what they were before we started that, I think that program's been successful. And uh, I think to some extent it's being emulated around the state, and we're, we're all kind of pleased about that, and I appreciate your comments about it. Too. Yeah. Thank you. Just thank you to the entire council for your, your leadership. Ed? I just want to also want to thank you for coming. I think it's so important that you're here. I think we, we missed an opportunity, really. We had... You talked about the built environment and how the impact, clearly that impacts public health. And this is where it's designed at the city level. I think if we had, we went 40 years from 1960 to 2000, we didn't build any sidewalks. I feel like if the public health community and the, and the city had been more engaged, maybe things would have turned out different. And I just hope going forward that we continue. This is my kind of city council meeting. This is awesome. So I, I really appreciate uh, everything. I just want to ask you two questions. Following up on what on, on schools, there's a couple of bills this year, one by Richard Morissette on identifying and educating kids at risk of poor nutrition, and one by Anastasia Pittman for a health education uh, for Middle Schools Act. Can, can you talk about comprehensive health education? I know you touched on it a little bit, but also we, we talked with Janet Barisi here about six weeks ago, and she really she said that as part of the grading system, the A through F, that physical activity, nutrition, wellness, really isn't incorporated in that. Is there a way to incorporate the certified healthy schools standards or uh, wh where do you see health education, the, the possibilities for getting health education, how would you like to see that <clears throat> formulated and, and could that be incorporated into some of those grading systems? Again, I think it's a great question. I think that the continued partnership uh, with the Department of Education is going to be critical. The bills that we have introduced in the past have not been successful in doing that to the same extent. And there's, you may be familiar with the Fit Kids Coalition, uh, which has worked very, very aggressively around vending machines and uh, physical activity in schools. We did see some success over time, but it was a multi-year approach. It really, just as we're experiencing with uh, tobacco, too, a multi-year approach. I think if you stay tuned that you may see some um, movement from the governor, uh, who has been a very, very strong health advocate. She had, as you may know, uh, signed into uh, an executive order last year banning the use of tobacco use on all state property. Um, so she's kind of a parallel to, to, to you. Um, she said, I'm going to do what I can do. I have limitations within the law, but I can do an executive order that will ban it on all state property. Uh, I think you will see some movement. She's been very engaged in our Shape Your Future campaign um, and helped launch that Shape Your Future campaign. So you'll see some movement there. Um, and I would take that as, as a very encouraging sign about the amount of attention uh, that we'll have to this issue with the schools. Can I ask one final question, and that's on, on poverty. As I read through the public health literature, it seems to me that public health is at least as strong a determinant as smoking. I mean, po poverty is at least as strong a determinant as um, smoking. We, in Oklahoma City, we have about 17% of our population living in poverty. Mm -hmm. So 600,000 people, roughly one out of six people, 100,000 people in the Oklahoma City borders living in poverty. If you look at the city counties, um, th this is, the, the different colors represents wellness scores. Mm -hmm. And the dark blue, you see that those with the, the worst public health outcomes are all concentrated in one cluster in the dark blue, basically within 10 zip codes. Mm -hmm. That also, if you overlay poverty, matches up very well. And I know correlation and causality are different, but um, I just want to ask you about, <clears throat> um, we, we have very low unemployment here, but we have so many people living in poverty, so clearly people are, are working, but still within the poverty level. Um, Obama talked several years ago about trying to get the minimum wage increased. Um, if you take, say, 1968, the inflation-adjusted 
minimum wage at that time would be $10.50. Today it's $7.25. Is it a fair statement that as the years go by and we don't see an increase, that as, as inflation increases, that segment of the population is falling further and further behind and just from a public health perspective would have a harder and harder time meeting some of these public health objectives? So I'm, I'm not an economist, uh, so I don't want to exceed the scope of my uh, knowledge base here. So I can't really speak to the relationship with the minimum wage. What I can speak to is that direct relationship between poverty and health outcomes. Uh, it has been widely, widely researched. There's no doubt that there's a very strong correlation there. Uh, what I don't know as much about is then how do you turn that economic uh, picture around and how do you do that? Is it around job creation? Is it, and you end up with this kind of circular uh, dilemma. Uh, how do you make you know, this uh, community or the state uh, a place where businesses will invest so that you're creating jobs, so that you're actually making it a desirable place to live, that people will settle. It's part of what I see happening with a larger Oklahoma City, uh, is it kind of changes that, transforms uh, uh, an old, old outdated <coughs> image. Uh, I think that's been a challenge for us. You know, specifically targeting within the northeast part of Oklahoma City, which is actually where I live, um, we, you know, have the Oklahoma City has just placed their regional center uh, there, which will be opening in the not too distant future. They'll be having their grand opening there. And part of the goal is not only to provide opportunities for uh, physical activity in terms of the fields and things like that, but also uh, being a resource for the community. And so there will be active uh, services around jobs and, and other things. And I think that's being done out of that recognition. Uh, that if you have an impoverished uh, community and you don't see changes with that, you will continue. All other factors, uh, even seeing some improvement, uh, you're going to be very, very limited in terms of the overall health improvement that you'll see. It's just a huge driver. You saw it in that map. So you take this map and you enlarge it to that United States map that I showed. Uh, it's the same principle in terms of poverty. Well, I would hope that we could at least start a dialogue. I don't, you know, it's obviously things like minimum wage are much more than just public health. But there are 14 states who have, who have decided not to wait any longer and have increased the minimum wage on their own. Our neighbors in Santa Fe have just increased the minimum wage, not wanting to wait any longer. And I just wonder if that, if specific poverty measures should be part of our public health discussions. Thank you. Larry? Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming, Dr. Coyne. Quick question, if I could. <clears throat> Uh, in the area that I serve, a number of the students that uh, go to our elementary schools and uh, are on the free lunch program. The, the food that they're served there during their free lunches and their free breakfast, does the state health department, do you all look at that to see if that uh, meets kind of the, the, the caloric uh, intent, the good health intent to fight obesity? The uh, food program that you have in the schools is actually a federal program through the uh uh, USDA, so that is not uh, administered by uh, the state at all. That's a federal program. And actually there were uh, guidelines that were changed just this last year that are going into effect this year uh, to increase the number of fruits and vegetables uh, that are provided as part of that. So that's, you have flexibility, so again this is back to the, uh, there are certain minimum requirements that you must meet if you participate in that program as a federal program, then schools have the ability to tailor that. You know, many schools, it's, we have been our own worst enemy. Uh, so you walk in and a lot of schools were contracting out those services. And literally, you had you know, this fast food line here and you had in your school. So you might have a Pizza Hut line here and a Taco Bell line here and some other line there. Uh, so schools for healthy lifestyles have really grabbed hold of that and recognize that we need to make sure we're providing that as an opportunity. But we do not have authority over that particular program in the schools. That's a federal program, USDA. And then along the same line, uh, in, in working, I, I've put some hours in uh, working in a food pantry, and uh, you used the term uh, macaroni and cheese. As, mm -hmm. uh, I can remember handing out a number of boxes of macaroni and cheese to people who needed food, but what I got from you was that could be a self uh, a fulfilling prophecy of, of promoting obesity in the people that are eating that. Did I take that wrong or is that a correct assumption? Well, if the choice is between macaroni and cheese and, and you can provide uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, I would opt for the fresh fruits and vegetables. You end up with a lot of management challenges, of course, right? 
that macaroni and cheese can sit on the shelf for ever how long it can sit there. And the fresh fruits and vegetables, the uh, volunteer work that I've done with food pantries, it's a challenge having perishable items there. So that becomes the same challenge for the stores, for the convenience stores and everyone else. If you had that uh, as an option, that would be fantastic. And actually you reminded me, so we do have, there is a program we're trying to support, a farm to school program, which is helping to bring fresh fruits and vegetables from local producers directly into the schools. Might be that you could do something like that with your pantry as well, uh, to actually have an arrangement with a, with a local producer. Say we will, you know, during the growing season, uh, you bring those here, we'll make sure they get distributed out uh, to you uh, or to other people, some sort of partnership like that. Right. All right. <clears throat> Dr. Klein, thank you very thank much you very for much, coming. Thank you very much, Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your Thanks. work. We're on item 3B of the council agenda. The next item is the appointment of Jim Roth to the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust. Is there a motion? Yes. Second. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. On to item four, it's the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for January 22nd. And item 4B is to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for January 15th. Comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And item five is uncontested continuances. Mayor, just a couple this morning. Uh, in addition to the, the one listed on your docket for item uh, 8A, I've misplaced them. They are on uh, page 10 under item 8G1, under 8G1, item B, 2120, Glenn Ellen, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. Item C, 3129, Pioneer Avenue, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. And finally, item J, 2341, Northwest 33rd Street, we ask that that be stricken, again, the owner has secured. All right, any other? Any other requests for uncontested continuances? We'll recess the council meeting, convene the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Four items. Any comments or questions on the MFA? All right, let's catch your votes. Passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCMFA, convene the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. There are three items. Make it four items. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. <coughs> Passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, just the claims and payroll. Stack, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right, we have a motion and a second. Are there any individual considerations? Uh, Mayor, I had two quick things, uh, 6H7 and 6X. Q and R, please. All right. Meg, you want to get started with item H? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is actually an item that's being introduced today, and it's uh, being set for final hearing on February 19th, um, but I'm not going to be here on February 19th, so I wanted to mention it today. And this is a special permit um, issued for the uh, YWCA's uh, domestic violence shelter. And I think many people know that the, the Y has been um, undergoing a capital campaign to do more than double the capacity um, that they have available. Our um, shelter um, providing services to battered women remains 99.9% .9 full 365 days of the year. It's one of the, it's actually the only certified shelter in the county and uh, this will provide um, a tremendous opportunity to serve many more people. I, I think Chief City has told us that uh, the police uh, receive about 120 domestic violence calls a week, an extremely high number. And so I really wanna um, just bring attention to the work that Jan Perry and her staff and her board are doing to um, address this issue in the community. All right, thanks uh, Meg, item X. And item X is one of many um, MAPS three uh, issues that are on our agenda today, but I did wanna just bring special attention to um, this item and it's the contract for architectural services for the uh, new Expo building that's being built out at the fairgrounds. And um, you know, this is, a fantastic project. We're going to take the seven 
buildings that are out there and combine them really into one under roof large facility for use by all of the community um, efforts uh, that take advantage of our fairgrounds. And so it's really, it's a super project and a great master plan. Ellen Brown is here today if you'd like to grill oh. him. <laughs> Were you gonna talk about this or just to be? Great, well, thank you for being here, Ellen. It's a really terrific project. Ed, you wanted to talk about q and R. Wanna, this is the, the incentive program, interstate job transfer incentive program for Boeing, and I just wanna, I'd like to vote on this separately. I'd also like to express caution uh, as we um, vote on this today and also enter into, this is 1.8 million for some 285 jobs, and then we look at another four and a half million for between eight and 900 jobs. That combined would represent about almost 10% of our 2007 GO bond incentive fund, uh, which was about 75 million. Boeing, my understanding is part of the 21st century quality jobs from the state for the 200, the arrangement was that for 255 jobs, the maximum amount of money through payroll rebates over 10 years would be 26 million. So Boeing is, is, is going to receive some, the, a maximum of $26 million uh, for these 255 jobs, and then we'll add 1.8. I'm, I'm not sure that this deal doesn't get done uh, for 26 million as opposed to 28 million. Um, this is part of the Boeing business model. It, it was uh, profitable every year for a decade between 2002 and 2011, and despite being profitable every single year, paid a net by, by moving, deferring income by parking a lot of money offshore, paid a net tax of negative 6.5% on all the, all the business that Boeing does over a decade, negative 6.5%. So it's different than a zero sum game as some people argue. It's actually a net outflow of taxpayer dollars uh, uh, which shrinks the tax base necessary for the education and infrastructure investments which benefit all employers. That's the risk. Um, realize that we can call this job creation or we can call this whatever we like, but it's not new jobs, it's job movement. It's interstate job transfers uh, of jobs that already exist. Some 80% of states, 40 out of 50 states, do not allow intrastate job incentives, including Oklahoma. In other words, you can't give incentives to move jobs from Enid to Oklahoma City, Ponca City to Oklahoma City, but it's okay Ponca City's not okay, but you can go to Wichita and give incentives to move them from Wichita to Oklahoma. I, I think we have to look at the, why you would have the rationale for not allowing intrastate job incentive movements, but you would allow us to go a little bit further to Wichita. Some of the same rationale is gonna apply. The problem is that a tiny number of companies get huge subsidies, but the net impact of jobs is minimal. Uh, and so a concern I have is that we're not diversifying our incentives. Existing in-state and city uh, expansion of, of existing businesses in your city uh, and new startups accounts for almost all of your job creation, not moving jobs within a state or from one state to the other. It's, it's taking businesses that already exist and, uh, and helping to, to expand or doing new startups. I was struck when we went to Minneapolis, we did an inner, inner city visit, and, and our, our visitors were asking their chamber of commerce and their mayor, what kind of, you have so many Fortune 500 companies in Minneapolis. How do you, what kind of incentives do you get to get these companies? And there, there was a complete disconnect between our question. It's, we don't give incentives for interstate job transfers. We invest in our own companies here in Minneapolis and we grow them. And that's how we create new jobs, not move jobs that already exist uh, to a, a new, uh, uh, to the city. So. That, that's my concern. Pat Ryan, uh, who unfortunately is not here, he talked about, uh, I believe during MAPS 3, and he's talked about an incubator program. Imagine $75 million of this GO bond going towards a business incubator program. How many jobs would that create? Um, $28 million for 255 jobs seems uh, steep. And so I would question, are there studies that compare the effectiveness of interstate job transfer incentive programs with job expansion programs with the city's existing businesses. Last year's Chamber of Commerce survey on company expansion 
indicated that there seems to be a need for that. Businesses have the space on hand to expand, and many want to expand. Um, I guess the final question would be, let's say that Oklahoma City does decide to uh, engage in this, and, and it's not just the 26 million from the state, but we want to give local incentives also. Because we're going to get these jobs that, that are within Oklahoma City, but being only one of two states that, that is only able to derive our general fund from sales tax, income tax that is generated by these jobs doesn't come to us, property tax, it's sales tax. So I guess the question would be, where do these new employees that are working at Boeing, where do they live? Do they live in Oklahoma City? Or what percentage live in Edmond, Midwest City, Moore, Norman? And so sales tax is actually being generated in all those regionally. And so I guess one question is, why does Oklahoma City bear 100% of the incentive burden? Why isn't there a regional? Why isn't Edmond paying for some of the incentives? Why isn't Moore or Midwest City, which is right next, this is right next to Tinker. Uh, uh, why, why do those other municipalities not, uh, uh, why isn't there regional participation? The other, the other thing to look out for is that in this game, what, what has typically happened, and Boeing, as much as anybody else, you pay for the interstate job transfer. You get the jobs to your community. And then what happens is that you get asked later for retention incentives. If the, Wichita gave lots of incentives for, for, for those jobs, and now they're leaving. So at some point, as jobs are being transferred in this shell game, one thing that happens is that then these companies come to you a decade later and say, we need to move to X. Will you pay retention incentives to keep these jobs? If the rationale is that it's worth $28 million to move these 255 jobs today, a decade from now, will it be worth another $28 million to keep them here? And I just bring that up because it's happened over and over and over empirically, and I think it just needs to be on our radar. The, the bottom line is that factors such as the cost and quality of labor, the quality of public services, the proximity to markets, and the access to raw materials and supplies are much more important than tax incentives and business location decisions. <laughs> Boeing is moving next to Tinker Air Force Base because they're consolidating and, and saving money. Uh, I loved the, the mayor's interview with Streets Blog, which is a two-part, thousands of words, the mayor very eloquently laid out how we are able to, there's 2,000 people coming to the metro area, and our unemployment rate is staying the same. So we're, we're generating jobs. It's not, there wasn't one word in that, in that interview about interstate job incentives. Uh, it's build, it's spending, investing in yourself, building your quality of life, having uh, lower cost of living. Those are the kind of things that bring jobs. Not, uh, I don't think the studies bear out interstate job transfer incentives. Thanks. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? And Ed, you want to pull those two items and vote separately? Okay. Um, can we have the motion then for uh, the consent docket minus Q and R? Mayor. Um, you want to I, talk about I, one I of the items first? I just want to make a comment and <clears throat> probably could do it with items for council, but let me just go ahead and acknowledge okay. it now. Which item on, do you want to speak uh, on? 6 Okay. And this is just a, uh, uh, a thank you to the uh, Board of County Commissioners of Oklahoma County to partnership with the City of Oklahoma City on the ASA uh, uh, Softball Hall of Fame to uh, the improvements of the parking lot at the uh, Softball Hall of Fame. And uh, we'd just like to thank um, particular uh, County Commissioner Willa Johnson for her leadership in uh, making sure that we have a partnership as it relates to this project. Appreciate that. All right, so can the motion be for the consent docket minus Q&R? Gary, I think you made the motion. All right, nodding his head. All right, uh, so we're voting on the consent docket except for Q&R. Cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. And now we're gonna, how about a motion on Q&R? Okay, vote on Q&R and it passes seven to one. Onto the concurrence docket, there are two items. 
Do we have a second? All right. Comments or questions on the concurrence? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Now we're on to item eight. These are items that require a separate vote. First item, 8A, has already been deferred until February 19th. Item 8B has to do with the city's retirement systems. comes from our personnel department. Uh, Mayor, this was presented last week at, at Council, and these uh, ordinances need to be in place before January 31st. So today we're, we're asking that this be approved on final hearing with the emergency. Okay. All right, comments or questions on item 8B? All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And a second? second? Cast your votes on the emergency. Passes 8-0. Item 8C changes some of the operations for our model airplane facilities out at Lake Draper. We have one person that has signed up to speak. Uh, John Bart? Mayor, it might be, if Marsha could outline the, the, the what the ordinance is, then he could comment on that. Maybe help us so we all understand exactly what the ordinance is. Sounds good to me. Marsha, you want to have a stand up yeah. here and then we'll hear from John. Good morning, Mayor and Council. It, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning to introduce the Radio Controlled Model Aircraft Ordinance. Debbie, I, I, I'm not advancing. If you'd help me, please. Thank you. The, Baxter Flying Field is land leased on the Lake Draper West Elm Creek Reservation at roughly southwest, southeast 119th Street and West Lake Stanley Draper Drive. The club's been in operation, the Baxter Flying Club, for 30 years. This ordinance amendment, again, please. Uh, we, we need to let you know that the club's making a lot of improvements at the facility. Next slide, please. And finally, that the ordinance specifically designates this area for the, for the use as a flying field, that it creates fees, permit fees for uh, use at the field, annual fees of $50 a year for adults and $25 a year for youth, for example. It creates regulations for operation based on the Academy of Modern Aeronautics, pardon me, the Academy of Model Aeronautics standards we propose, we present the ordinance today. We propose it for consideration at a public hearing on the 2nd of February and for possible adoption on the 19th of February. Okay. Morning, John. Thanks for your patience this morning. We'll need your name and address for the record, please. Good morning, sir. My, uh, my name is John Barrett. My address is 804 North West 8th Street, Moore, Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, I'm the acting president or current president of the Baxter Model Flying Club. Uh, we're a rather large group, 60 people in our club. There are a number of clubs in the area. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the sport, uh, the wonderful thing about clubs is that we promote the, the sport and the hobby uh, among all people. And as a group, we like to, uh, we bring people in and we teach them about the sport, how to fly, how to fly safely. Uh, what we are hoping to, to achieve here by improving the facilities is uh, not just to help Baxter fly, Flying Club, but all the local clubs, plus it will give us the opportunity to sponsor and host state events, statewide events. There are a number of, of places we have. Uh, El Reno has for a number of years sponsored the Warbirds over Oklahoma, uh, which that has become a little bit unhinged they don't actually have a home at the moment we might be able to sponsor them and have them here uh, but there are a number of events i have a, a very short youtube video which i would like to present to you if i may uh, it is what's, actually what's going to show us john uh, it is a it is an event which was held in lindsay oklahoma last year uh, it is the type of event we hope to have here or that we hope to host here well, can we just see a few seconds of it? Yes, sir, I, you I just may. don't want to establish a precedent of people Indeed. showing up with YouTube videos. And Indeed, I, I, I apologize. I, I wish I had I, I, been able so, to mention it earlier, but well, um, I don't mind seeing a few seconds of it just to give us an idea of what we're discussing. That yes, might sir, be that's pertinent. Fine. Uh, okay.
Okay. John, you want to come back up to the microphone? So what you're saying is an example of, of what could be taking place inside the Oklahoma City limits. And yes, you, sir, that's we, right. we're trying to uh, establish at Lake Draper a, a newer and better place for a hobbyist to fly these planes. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, do we have a motion then on item 8C? Yeah, I, I'd move approval. I tell you, th this is an ideal location for this. this. And this, the plan we're using here to uh, to run this is uh, one that we've is tr uh, been tested with the all-terrain vehicle folks that are located close to that place. And we're just trying to give the model airplane folks some ownership in the in the operation and in the hopes that that'll bring it up a notch. And, and it, uh, it certainly has worked with the ATV people and we, uh, we have every reason to think it'll work here, so I'm real excited about it. See, I mean, it's great to have all these user groups. I mean, that's right. what, it's, what it's for. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and it's nice when they all work together. Right. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 8C. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8D addresses some of the regulations about street vendors. A couple of changes on the downtown design districts, uh, and Russell Klaus is here this morning to outline those for us. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, as you know, from we, the Planning Department is in charge of the administration of all of the different design districts, and uh, one of those is the downtown design district. And from time to time, uh, we find it necessary to make various modifications to the to the ordinance to enable it to be more effective and easier to use. Um, we had a couple of instances in last year that. Uh, generated the need to make some changes, so we took that opportunity to uh, review other things. We generally keep a list of changes as as we run into these over time, and then we try and present these on a fairly regular basis, every six to twelve months, but, but once a year is our preference. Uh, so these are the downtown design districts, and this is what would be affected by this particular ordinance change. And um, there are two urgent, issue, two urgent issues that relate to what I was talking about in, uh, in triggering these changes. One is outdoor sales and display, and we ran into an issue last year at the Myriad Gardens where uh, we were unable for, to support vendors who were selling water and other necessities in support of events in the gardens. Um, that has been addressed on a temporary basis with a variance to the Board of Adjustment, but this is a permanent solution with the ordinance that will permit the, um, um, for, for events to be able to operate outdoor sales and display and, and enable them to operate just as you would see them anywhere else in the country. And uh, we also found an oversight uh, that affects just the downtown District 1, Transitional District 1, uh, where we there was a, uh, a mistake that prevent that uh, exempted off-site temporary staging for construction, and this affects the edge development. Uh, at this point in time, they are actually not permitted to be uh, to to do off-site staging. So this corrects that error as well. So these were the two main changes that we have made to the made to the ordinance to uh, facilitate these two activities in the future. Um, other things that we've done, we've changed um, oh, for outdoor, for outdoor uh, sales and display. Uh, again, this is to uh, facilitate non-accessory uh, merchandise to be sold in the district. Um, it ensures that this is a temporary arrangement, so when these uh, 
uh, goods are not being actively marketed, that they have they have to be removed. And uh, if if they're not, um, it also prevents, uh, as we have in the past, it will clarifies the prohib prohibition about sales around the memorial because of the sanctity of that site. Well, uh, Russell, may I just go back to that slide? Is sure. that designed to, for instance, allow the pop-up shop kind of thing Correct. that they've done yes. in the gardens or the festival or where they wouldn't normally be selling merchandise? But yeah, it's, 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 rec it's recognizing that the downtown environment is changing substantially. The kinds of activities that are now being proposed in the downtown area, this is to facilitate that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, in terms of general cleanup, we've, we've changed, these are uh, changed definitions. Uh, one of the main things here is that we've allowed for appeal of administrative approvals. So if we provide administrative approval that somebody um, was dissatisfied with or disapproval, that they would be able to appeal that to the DDRC and you know, get a second hearing on that. Um, on new provisions that we've included, uh, we have always encouraged a preliminary review of projects. Uh, that is now captured within the ordinance so that that is uh, uh, clearer to applicants that it is something that uh, we would like to see them do, particularly for those complex, large-scale projects. Uh, we've also added intent language for uh, parks and open areas, which was something that was missing before. Uh, large display banners have become more uh, common in activities in the downtown area, so we want to ensure that the guidelines regarding when and how long those can be up are, are, are clear to everybody. And then various setback requirements, run the setback issues where we're actually, the, the older provisions are encouraging the kind of thing that we don't want to see. So uh, that should make it easier for the kind of urban development that we're encouraging from here on in. Um, fencing, uh, we had to modify the fencing standards for the city as a whole as regards front yard fencing to be able to facilitate what we were looking for with front yard fencing in the downtown district. So that's the intent there and also prohibiting the, the uh, kinds of fencing that you don't want to see in the downtown area, particularly the um, standing rib steel fences really don't work that well in, in an urban environment. Uh, we have been through a design committee saw this in October, it's been through the Planning Commission and now it's before you today for uh, consideration. And um, I'll be happy to answer any other questions on it. I, uh, one of the, uh, the points was to restrict sales around the memorial. Correct. When you say restrict, was, I mean, are they allowed it now or? No, that's been, um, that's been a limitation for some time. I, I, the, the language clarifies that. Um, it's to ensure that you don't have hot dog vendors set up around the memorial. It's, it's recognizing the sanctity of, of that district in the downtown area. So are, are they prohibited as opposed to restricted? This would prohibit this, yes. Okay. Russell, early on you talked about uh, allowing uh, off-site staging in district number one. Could you explain what that means? A little well, bit? when you're doing a, um, a project of the scale of the edge, for example, um, you're tearing up the entire site to be able to redevelop it, so you need an off-site area to stage your operations where you have your, uh, your construction site trailer and other activities required to support the development. <laughs> That, that's that's all it is. All right. Any other comments or questions for Russell? All right, thanks, Thank Russell. Thank you. Do we already have a motion on this? Second. All right, we're voting on 8D. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8E, make some alterations to TIF 8. Um, the ordinance amendment before you today amends the project plan for TIF number 2 and TIF number 8. Um, we're going to start with TIF number eight. Um, first of all, the amendment um, that's before you today proposes to decrease the overall budget for TIF eight from the original budget of 175 million and decreases it to 157 million. On the more specific um, project categories, there is an increase in the redevelopment framework 
uh, project, which we also know as Project 180, to increase that budget from 115 million to 121 million. And this reflects the budget changes for Project 180 that the City Council has already um, considered and approved. We also propose to decrease the budget for other economic developments from 40 million to 24 million and the money set aside for the other taxing jurisdictions from 20 million to 12 million. And those will all add up to the reduced budget of $157 million. Um, we've reduced the budget, if you recall, because some of the revenues associated with the Devon project did not come in as anticipated. In particular, the sales tax revenues from the construction of their building were not as high as what we originally projected them to be. Therefore, we did not have as much cash to cash fund some of the project costs of Project 180 and had to use debt to finance those. So that resulted in an overall decrease in the budget for TIF-8. There are also some other amendments associated with TIF-8 that include a new definition or an expanded definition of what other economic development is. Um, and that can be found on page 11 of the red line uh, version of the project plan that's in your packet. Um, the other change allows for the, um, the de for the Devon Implementation Committee to be dissolved once the Project 180 um, projects are completed. So that will happen in a few years from now, probably. Um, the ordinance also provides for several changes to TIF number two, and this is our overall downtown TIF district. Um, these changes proposed to increase the budget for TIF-2 because TIF-2 is actually performing better than in originally anticipated when we set it up um, almost 12 years ago now. Um, so those changes include increasing the budget for residential development from 20 million to 30 million, increasing the hotel and commercial development category from 20 million to 30 million, and increasing other public development costs from 15 million to 20 million. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions about TIF changes, and that will be before you for final hearing on February 26th. Okay, item just being introduced today. Yes. All right, and the final hearing on February 26th. Can I just okay. ask about the 20 to 30 million hotel increase? What What's the? It's really a broad category that's for commercial development. So it's hotel, retail, commercial is the broad category that's in the project plan. And we've, we did use it for um, funding of the, the incentives for Scur the Skirvin Hotel, but really it's been mostly used for commercial development, like office or mixed use development. Could, could that ex extra 10 million be used for a convention center hotel or? It could be if the council decided that was what they wanted to do. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions on item 8E, item being introduced today, final hearing on February 26th. All right, how about a motion? Second. Cast your votes, and this one moves on. Item 8F is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8F? All right, how about a motion? I hear a motion in a second, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 8G is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any item listed under 8G? All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes, and 8G passes unanimously. Item 8H has to do with MAPS 3. Looks like David Todd is here. He's gonna give us a little bit of a preview of what might be coming up with the Whitewater facility. Good morning. I'm happy to be here this morning to talk to you about the Whitewater facility. We've got a lot of exciting things going on at the river, as you well know. So this is a site evaluation and conceptual design report. It's not a preliminary report. <clears throat> if you recall, there were certain issues on this site that we needed to clear up before we got fully going on the uh, on the project itself. Brent, you may have to forward this, this isn't working. <clears throat> this is the general layout, the conceptual layout of the Whitewater facility. And you'll see on the left, there's an entry building. <clears throat> and then you'll see the three basic channels of the Whitewater facility. There's a lower channel, which is a flat channel <clears throat> that's used just for paddling and, 
and going to access the, the top pool. So then there's the uh, middle channel, which is a more aggressive, steeper channel that's used for events and for competition. And then the top channel would be the recreational channel, which is a, a flatter gradient and not as aggressive channel. The start line, well, let me start with the, the potential users would come in the plaza area and go in the entry building. In that entry building, there would be locker rooms, uh, restrooms, and ticketing facilities, the administrative part of it. Then they would cross the, the channel and go over to the orientation pavilion where they would would get their orientation on how to conduct and how to use the, the kayaks. And then they would proceed on to the raft storage where they would receive the, the kayak and the helmets and the paddles. And that would essentially be the starting point where you would paddle through flat water, calm water, up to conveyor belt that's shown there at the pump. And that conveyor belt would take you up to the top pool. And that top pool is about 20 feet higher than the rest of it. And then you would pick the channel that you wanted to to go on for your, your event. This is a cross section of that channel. Um, <clears throat> you can see that there's competition buoys there hanging, but there's ADA access points. And as I said, beginner and, and freestyle channels, both um, the layout edge, the, the different aspects of, of the channel there. This is a cross-section I really want to talk about that shows both sides, the competition channel and the recreational channel. So the competition channel side is set up kind of like bleachers, but they're not really bleachers. It's just how the, the, the berm would be situated so that it allows a lot of seating over there for the competition. The recreational side will be more of a, a smoother transition with trees and shade, and you can put a blanket and watch your, your family go down the channel. This is conceptual design of, of some massing for the structures. With the structures, we'll have the main building, as I mentioned, the kayak storage, boater orientation building, and then another kayak storage for, for permanent storage, and then pavilion, possibly for future development. Top picture shows a uh, building that is closest to I-35, and we hope that that would be kind of an iconic structure there that you could see from I-35 might have some signage, it might have special lighting, but it's anticipated that, that building might be a story and a half or so, and then the one side of it might be two and a half stories high. You can see kind of the scale with the people. Lower picture shows that entry pavilion that I, I mentioned earlier. The left would be the administrative offices, um, possible ticketing, lockers, those kind of things. And then you can see a possible fountain structure there in the middle of the pavilion. And then on the right might be a, a future building that we could put in there. The, the building on the left is about 18,000 square feet, and we hope to give that the possibility of being uh, changed to two-story in the future. And then this is right about at 6th and Phillips is that entry. <clears throat> the, the main part of, of this, this conceptual design report is really concentrating on the technical issues. And some of those technical issues are listed there one of the main ones was a 54-inch sanitary sewer that extended along 5th Street. Um, go ahead to the next slide. The, the sewer, it's anticipated to relocate that would be about three-quarters of a million dollars. So the, the whole point is to keep the, the whitewater facility south of that, that sanitary sewer line. And that's what we've done in this, in this conceptual design. Also involved with this site was some existing overhead, not only distribution, but also transmission lines from og &E that they have in this area. Right now, we believe that, uh, that we're in good shape with og &E to get those relocated, and we'll be able to, to construct this just as we'd planned, and those will be removed. One of the other issues that was of great concern was floodplain. And, and on this picture, the whitewater facility is at the upper left. You can see I-35 in there. It's in that little pocket just north of the river. And the whole area is got 100-year floodplain on it. So the buildings will be raised to elevation 1177, which would be one foot above the 100-year flood. And then the, the channel itself, which obviously has water in it, will be a one foot above the 50-year floodplain. So because it's water, we don't have to be above the 100, but we want to be high enough that we're not getting 
debris in there every time we, we get a rain. This is a preliminary grading plan that's been developed for the site because of those geometrics that I just described, the, squeezing it down south of the sanitary sewer. We're not able to completely balance the site, and, and what we mean by balance is all the cut and all the fill equals out, but we have identified a, a good source of some dirt that we think we can get at a really good price. Another issue that we've looked at is uh, oil wells. We know if there's three, there might be four oil wells in this area. We should be able to cap those and, and deal with those appropriately. One thing that's come up quite often is water quality and how this will, will operate. Right now, the, the consultant has had a lot of discussions with the uh, Department of Labor and with the Health Department on how this would, would be looked at. And right now, the decision that they've all come to is that it will be looked at as an amusement ride. And it's, it's really not an amusement ride, but that's how they're going to look at it as far as water quality. We're not going to have to keep the water to, say, a swimming pool standard, but it will be to uh, good quality. It's not going to be using river water. It's anticipated that the original fill of about 13 million gallons will come from municipal water, but the daily water that we lose every day from splash or, or from evaporation will be made up through a well that will be on site. As far as zoning, we're, we meet all the zoning requirements. It should be noted that because of where this is, off-street parking is not required, but we are going to provide 300 paved parking spaces to uh, to serve this facility, and it can also be used as overflow throughout the, the Boathouse District. This is the layout of the property owners. There are 14 different property owners in this area. There is 11.4 acres of private land and 2.5 acres of ODOT land, and the city owns the rest in this area. Um, the consultant and the subcommittee and the advisory board has all recommended that we purchase all the property in there. We won't need it all right now, but we will need it for expansion. We need area for possible expansion. We hope that we can add another channel in future years, and then, of course, parking will always be needed to be expanded in there. So going to the budget, right now we are under budget. You can see the, uh, the line items there, just a little under the budget. And this includes the, the facility that I've shown, but also a main building of about 18,000 square feet and ancillary buildings of 6,000 square feet for a total of 24,000 square feet in total buildings. And uh, we hope that there might be some alternates that we can do for this. Here's your schedule. Basically have a 26 month schedule starting from today. I won't go through each of these, but the, the plan would be for a soft opening in February of 2015. Soft opening meaning that it's ready to go, but we're not really taking patrons. We'll be uh, training and, and getting employees there so that they can learn to operate the facility and make sure everything's going smooth. And then hopefully in April of 2015, we'll open. The weather will be great. It, it's a good time of year, and we'll, we'll be ready to raft. Your Honor. Yes, David. Uh, David, are the channels all concrete? Yes, they are. What's the depth of them, roughly? They're about six feet. Okay. And I guess, will they look concrete, or will they give the appearance of more of a natural? They'll concrete? be full cleared pretty much to the top. I think they'll look a little bit like a swimming pool edge, um, but it won't, I don't think it'll look like a swimming pool. There'll be so much churning of the, of the water, and it'll be you know, hard to see all the way to the bottom. And there's a special system that is used for the baffles to make the, the white water itself. And will it be open year round or? I, I'm not sure, I, you know, in de December, January, I'm, I, I'll bet that the, the people who do it in competition would want to, to operate it, but w that'll be an operations issue we'll have to look at. Mm -hmm. Save yep. it. Uh, several years ago, we had a uh, inner city visit with uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and we visited the uh, Whitewater Project there. How uh, close as far as the design of our project will it be to the project in, in <clears throat> Charlotte, or do you know? I think that there's some similarities and there's also some obvious differences. The Charlotte area is, is m much bigger and, and was kind of integrated with their river. Ours is 
is not, but we have the same designer that worked on the Charlotte facility, and I can't speak completely to that, but I think okay. it'll be similar in some respects, but, but it's very unique. Okay. Probably one of the bigger differences is the Charlotte facility it was a long ways from Charlotte, and if you remember, it's a pretty good bus ride out there, and ours will be walking distance to Bricktown. Any other comments or questions for David? All right, David, thanks. Thank you. How about a motion then on item 8H? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8I, I understand we do not need executive session. All right, how about a motion then? Move it forward, motion to strike, cast your votes. Item struck. Item 8J, claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here wishing to speak or any item listed under 8J? All right, how about a motion? motion? Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item nine is items from council. And uh, Skip, you have one for you'd like us to look at. Well, uh, thank you, Mayor. This is a, um, a, a concern that has been um, a continued concern as it relates to our planning commission and the movement of, of items from the planning commission to city council. Uh, I had asked staff as a result of a, a, uh, an applicant or an, an application that's been before the Planning Commission, I think for, I know at least three months or four months. And uh, as a result of the complaints from both sides in reference to uh, having a decision, and of course I think we just saw a, another issue where it's similar to what the outcome here could be, and that is that there is no action on the Planning Commission. It just moves to, to, uh, to council. And uh, based on, on that research, uh, staff advised me that there was not a time frame that's set in the ordinance as it relates to how long a matter can stay within the Planning Commission. And so this is to, to give some, uh, some time frame that everyone would have, you know, full knowledge of that after uh, the public hearing that it would be 60 days that the matter would move to, to council um, with or without a, a uh, vote of approval or disapproval by, by the Planning Commission. What if both sides of an issue and the Planning Commission wanted to keep deferring it, keep talking about it, keep trying to work things out. Would it just automatically go to council? Is that your view? No. The, the amendment provides for that it doesn't, it doesn't include the time uh, for deferrals that are requested by or agreed to by the applicant. So if I the, see. Yeah, it okay. wouldn't count that. All right. Well, this is going to be introduced today, and then yeah. council will have an opportunity to talk to you or discuss it uh, in upcoming yes, sessions. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I guess we need, a, we need a motion on that. All right. Skip, you want to make a motion on that to uh, bring this? Motion that we move this to be introduced. All right. And a second. Bring it back in. All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Skip, any items from uh, other items from council? Uh, no, Mayor, but I would like to, 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 to say that I really do appreciate uh, your inviting, um, especially Dr. Klein. I, I think far too many times our citizens think that the only concern that we have as a council is issues of, of, of concrete and, and infrastructure. And I think there's a bigger human infrastructure in our society which has been uh, clearly identified that you know, we have been engaged in, and, and, and Councilman White has, has been a, a stalwart as it relates to the issue of smoking and fighting that battle with the legislature. And I, and I really appreciate, you know, us getting, you know, recognized and you bringing individuals, inviting them in to, to give us an opportunity to have this dialogue so our citizens can understand that we do have a, a caring heart when it comes to the issues of, of social concerns and, and health concerns in our society. Thank you. It was a good visit. Meg? Yeah, uh, very quickly, Mayor, I just want to thank the neighbors in Heritage Hills for inviting me to come on Sunday to uh, visit with their, um, an, at their annual meeting. Uh, we had really great dialogue, good questions, and um, city manager, the Heritage Hills neighborhood has voted to expend $30,000 in efforts for our quiet zone. 
So I wanted to make, make sure that you were aware of that. $30,000, isn't that terrific? Mm -hmm. I very much appreciate their concern. Uh, they did record the meeting, which was held at the Reduction Theater there on 13th and 16th and Broadway. And uh, we had to stop twice during the meeting because of the sound of the train. So <laughs> they have a vested interest in seeing this happen. And um, I also had a wonderful meeting with uh, a couple of the folks that are organizing the second annual Better Block um, event for Oklahoma City. They're planning on moving it this year uh, from 7th and Hudson, where it was last year, down to the farmer's market. And they're very interested in partnering with the city and talking about some innovative urban planning ideas. And so it was a really good meeting and a great way to start off Monday. So thank you. All right, David. Uh, Your Honor, I'd just like to say that uh, for those who weren't able to attend that last week's State of the City address that you uh, presented was just very interesting and very encouraging, and it just gives great hope to everybody in Oklahoma City as far as the uh, future of Oklahoma City. Uh, secondly, I'd like to uh, uh, comment on Dr. Klein's uh, presentation and uh, say that we really need to get support from as many uh, places as possible, even the uh, governor's office, I think, is this idea of allowing municipalities to begin to make uh, ordinances uh, addressing smoking. And so uh, hopefully we can, each of us, uh, reach out to con contacts that we have throughout the legislature, uh, as well as the governor's office. Uh, I think we need the support of the leadership from both houses of the legislature, as well as the governor's office, really kind of leading this case. So uh, hopefully we'll we'll get that support. Thank you. Uh huh. Pete. Uh, First thing is, most of, most of you may know that Leroy Hansen passed away just a couple of three days ago, and I'd like some kind of resolution on the agenda next week to, okay. to remember his contribution to the city. The second is, last week I had an opportunity to have lunch with a group of uh, young people. Uh, uh, they were called the, they're called the Capacity Corps. They uh, were, were here uh, from all over the country. Uh, working along with rebuilding together to, to repair a whole group of homes in Northeast Oklahoma City. Uh, really very, uh, very rewarding uh, experience talking to them. They're all, uh, most of them college graduates. So one of the guy that I sat next to was a Pittsburgh Pirate fan and he was a senior in college. So uh, he said he, was, he thought he was one of only about three that were not already graduates. It's kind of like a Peace Corps operation. And they come in and, and uh, work for people that need it, that individuals that live in their own homes and help them uh, rehab their home to the point they can stay there. Uh, just very encouraging. Uh, Rebuilding Together is just a great organization and for them to pull this together with this national organization really, uh, there were some people there whose homes were being worked on and um, just uh, to see the smiles on their faces and these kids just so uh, excited about doing it. They try, some of them go from city to city. Uh, uh, don't even, that, that, you know, that's what they do. They just go for there. It's like a year or two that they spend doing that, and it was just really uh, a rewarding experience. So I just wanted to comment on how nice it was. Thank you. All right. Larry? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, with regards to uh, the city's efforts on uh, getting the right to enact our own smoking uh, ordinances, Jim, this uh, Friday, we're hosting, are we not, the uh, state legislators at a luncheon where they'll be coming in, the Oklahoma City senators? And, Thursday. Mm -hmm. and so that'll be, a, that for our citizens out there, that'll be another opportunity that we'll have as a city body uh, to express our desire to have that passed along, along with David's uh, suggestion of getting the, the governor involved. So for citizens out there who are interested in, in this, uh, we are moving on it as, as best we can. Uh, then last week I had the privilege of attending two neighborhood meetings. Uh, one, uh, the Meridian Hills folks had the principal of Windsor Hills Elementary School come and give us an update on the demographics of Windsor Hills Elementary School and how that school has changed over the years from what it was when a number of us had moved in back in the uh, 
1960s and 1970s to what it was today, uh, presented his challenges uh, from an educational perspective, and everybody came away with the, uh, I think, the conclusion that uh, he's on the right track and we need to give him time and we need to work with him and we need to get involved and support uh, our Putnam City School District or our Oklahoma City School District, wherever you live, to the uh, maximum that we can. Uh, and then uh, and two nights later at the uh, Windsor Forest neighborhood meeting, uh, we had the opportunity after the meeting to visit with a citizen who had a particular concern. And I'd like to pass on, if you would, Jim, to uh, Major Becker and his staff and also to Cindy Richards for the way that the next day they began to address this situation. The situation is a very complex one, but uh, it, it told me that if a citizen has a, a legitimate concern, a neighborhood meeting is a great way to get that uh, brought up and the city staff will do its best within uh, their means to, uh, to see what kind of a rectification situ situation can be uh, put together. Thank you, Your Honor. Ed? I miss my uh, sparring partner, Pat Ryan. It's not, not the same without him. I wish him a speedy recovery. I wish he was here. I miss him. Um, I want to talk just for a second about uh, the IMSA situation, a lot in the news. Um, most recently, Revelation is that despite the contract with Paramedics Plus, which states unequivocally that Paramedics Plus will buy all their uh, fuel and maintain their vehicles, that IMSA had purchased some $7 million of, uh, of fuel just in a, a three-year period. I don't need to tell this council about the importance of sales tax and what um, being exempted from that sales tax means uh, to us as a body or our economy. Um, I agree with the Oklahomans editorial board that, that uh, referenced state auditor Gary Jones, who said the board has unintentionally fostered a culture of acquiescence in which officers and employees are permitted to establish inappropriate patterns of expenditure behavior and fail to disclose potential conflicts of interest unbeknown to members of the board. Lots of comments in the Tulsa World and editor, uh, Oklahoman comment section and emails to me and uh, other social media about corruption and uh, I just want to say about that, I think Pete White, uh, one of the most important things he taught me just immediately upon electing, being elected is that corruption is not, it's extraordinarily rare that people, that somebody would pass a briefcase of money under the table to someone. That just really doesn't happen. Corruption is about relationships uh, that occur generally over long periods of time. Uh, it's human nature if you develop friendships, if you work with people that maybe you you want them to do well, you share information that maybe you otherwise wouldn't have, you do something that maybe you otherwise wouldn't have. That, that's, that's the nature, uh, generally, of how, if, if there's corruption, that it occurs. It's, it's, um, and, and that's, I think, the, the basic problem, is that you have this incestuous blurring of boundaries beyond distinction um, between a public trust, which is EMSA, and it's for-profit subcontractor, which is Paramedics Plus. They're, they office together, their offices are right next together. They're, it's very difficult to figure out for me sometimes who works for who. Um, and you've had one CEO for 35 years, you've had Paramedics Plus in there for 14 years, so you have people that they are just side by side fighting battles, uh, working in a difficult healthcare environment for many, many years, and so, uh, at, at some point, uh, uh, improper uh, decisions are made, and I, I think it's the relationships that's, that's as much a role as anything. Um, the, the state auditor you know, pointed out that donations to nonprofits like First Tee, which is as good a nonprofit as, as any, um, but at a time when we're doing rate hikes, asking this council for rate hikes, for a public trust to be making donations, uh, in violation of, uh, apparent violation of the Oklahoma Constitution, that probably is about relationships. Um, um, I, um, I think that, uh, I just want to state unequivocally, because people are writing me and asking, I just want to state unequivocally that the, the response from the board needs to be swift, unequivocal, uh, there needs to be swift implementation of the state auditor's recommendations. I think there needs to be replacement of EMSA's uh, leadership, um, and, and, and changing of uh, personalities. I think if uh, those that we're responsible for, if Jim Couch had, had done the things that are, are outlined in the state auditors and other auditors, 
there's no question that, that he would not be the city manager anymore. I don't think he would do those, by the way. But he, there's no question that he or Kenny or the judges or anyone that this body has um, uh, employs directly would continue employment. Um, and finally, uh, any taxes that are owed, uh, I think, need to be uh, paid immediately. Any of those things don't happen, uh, and I think you sacrifice the public's trust. Uh, thank you. Gary? Uh, well, first, I, I too want to, uh, as Pete, give my condolences to the Hanson family. Uh, I, got, I got to know, um, actually worked with Leroy right at the end of his tenure with the city, but uh, more importantly, I got to know him as the father of John Hanson, one of my assistant chiefs, and uh, uh, I got to know Leroy well, and, and uh, he, he was uh, he was a great guy. Those of you that know Leroy know uh, how passionate he was about city government. John, I talked to John on the phone last night, and he said, all the way up till the end, Leroy would watch this council meeting and applaud or cuss as appropriate for, <laughs> for Leroy, you know. So uh, it, um, it, he's, uh, he, he was a great man, and I, uh, my condolences to the Hanson family. Uh, I don't want to belabor the ENSA issue uh, because I, I, I think that there's, there's been a lot of discussion on it. I just want to make one point to clear to the people that are watching. That audit done by the state auditor um, was uh, a little different than audits that, that we're used to in that if there was an audit done internally in the city and things were found uh, that needed to be adjusted, staff would have an opportunity to provide a response to that and provide um, either answers to the questions or provide information to the auditor prior to the audit being released that might clear up some of the questions. As a special audit from the state, IMSA staff was not afforded that opportunity. So uh, any of those things that are brought out in the audit, we haven't heard staff's answer to those yet, and that's what the, what the trust is working for. Uh, I think, uh, depending on how uh, my fellow councilman wants to define SWIFT, I think there will be action from the trust, but I think we do want to hear um, the other side of the story before we make those decisions and, and rush to judgment on anything. Uh, but I think it was a, a, a very uh, comprehensive audit. I think it brought up many things uh, that will be discussed uh, in the months to come. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of changes, uh, certainly in operations or in, in the uh, uh, things that, that go on uh, with the contract with Paramedics Plus will be looked at and possibly changed. But uh, I don't. I, I caution that we rush to judgment right now until we've had some of that inf other information come forward. All right. <coughs> City manager reports. Mr. Mayor, a couple of things this morning. First of all, um, in your packet there is a, a uh, December or uh, July to December revenue enforcement programs summary. Uh, that's uh, a good report to talk about some of our collection efforts. We also have the January uh, 13 sales and use tax report, and it's. The sales tax for, for uh, January is 4% is over last year, and we budgeted 3% over last year, so we're 1% over target, and, and we've had some very good months, so uh, that's, a, that's still a very strong sales tax. Would this Check. have been from the Christmas time period? It would have been uh, a little bit. A little bit. Beginning that's, of it. That's generally more credited to the February check, but part of, it, part of that, the, the, the early shopping would be in the January check. Okay. And then we also have a city manager uh, report regarding uh, uh, parade guidelines. We had some discussion about that a couple of weeks ago, and so we wanted to spell out exactly what the criteria are, what services we provide, how you go about doing a parade, and then we also listed what parades are out there and when they occur, just to get some information out there regarding, uh, regarding parades in general. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the council may have. Blair? On the parade, Jim, uh, when I was reading the, the, the information, I thought it said that 14 days before the actual event is when the parade organizers would communicate with the business owners. Did I pick that up right? Josh Bryant's here and, and can answer that question. I was running, Councilman. Could you restate the question? <laughs> when, I was, when I was reviewing the material on the parade, mm -hmm. I thought I read in there that it was a 14-day period before the event was held when the people involved putting on the parade uh, would sit down and talk with the business owners. Did I miss that? 
I think, we get? I think that's something that we're looking at for the future, but it's something that um, written into the revocables, there is a requirement for prior notice, but we haven't up until this point put a day stamp on it as to how far out front of the event um, they need to provide notification. What you're going through, it would be my, my uh, suggestion that that period of time be more than just the 14 days so that if there were any inconsistencies for want of a better thing, there'd be time to work it out. We wouldn't be down to the last minute. That uh, was my only question. Something that we're looking at for a guideline is a, a, a was a 14 to 21 day period, but um, I think kind of the standard that we're seeing from bigger cities and some of our peer cities is they've kind of looked at a, a 30 day period is a little more comfortable for them. So that's something we will be discussing. That would be in, in, with my th in tune with my thinking. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Right. Can, can I ask you about the paragraph Larry's asking you about where it says this guide will include a new requirement for parade organizers to work with owners of properties adjacent to the staging area to get permission to use the areas. Staging areas are gonna require consent from adjacent property owners in, within the closures of the staging, staging area. And um, that will require them to work very closely with everybody that they're gonna be staging. If they're, if they're staging in front of the street, in front of that business, it's gonna require that they make contact with them and work with them. And in some cases, obviously, they're gonna to have to negotiate with them as to how they allow access to the businesses. Now, it's gonna be a little bit different when it comes to the actual route um, and that can that that is defined a little differently by legal, but the staging area will require consent. And if the property owner does not give consent for that area, what we're looking at right at the moment is is that uh, they will have to require access to that property. So the, the 14 days Larry's asking you about, that's about the staging area. I, I think what Councilman McAtee is referring to is actually a written notification that tells them when, the who, what, when, and where of the event. Um, consent's gonna have to be worked out a lot earlier than that. Okay. And that would, st that would likely start, what we're looking at is a, for large events, a 120 day period when they start contacting us and working with us as to what they need for their event. That's likely when we're gonna be telling them, you need to start working on consent now if you've got a staging area for your parade. Josh, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's all, sir. Citizens to be heard. No one has signed up. All right, ready to adjourn? We're adjourned.